You are now listening to the Q&E Podcast. Is this what you want? Huh? Is this what you want? Well, try again, you got damaged. What's up, everybody? You are listening to the Q&E Podcast, and you're here with your boy Q Hicks right now. And I got Egga on the other line. Egga, tell the people what's good. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Q&E Podcast. This episode might be a little slim because we we dwindling down in football season, basketball season, they kick all the way off. But we got some sports topic for y'all, as always. You know, we're coming with the whole slate. Quincy, finna break it down for y'all. Yes, sir. If this is your first time listening to the Q&E Podcast, we do have five segments. We have our sports uh, sports topics. We have two wild Wednesdays. Social media wants to know. We have a lot for entertainment and current events, so definitely stick with us. And you already know we finish off the episodes with Pass the Ox with the songs of the weeks. So definitely stick with us throughout this whole episode. But first, we have to start it off with sports in the NFL Week 14 recap. And we got to talk about Herbert and Tua. This is a conversation that's tough for me, bro. I've been a Tua proponent since he's been drafted into the NFL. I was somebody who was big on Tua this season. So I was obviously on the MVP hype train for Tua, but the the past couple of weeks for Tua have been rough, bro. He didn't look good last week. He didn't look good against the Chargers. And it's starting to look like a question if Tua can really be that guy for the team. I'm not going to completely jump off ship. I'm not going to jump off ship. But a lot of the doubters who were just waiting in the, in the, in the woodworks really had their time to shine this week. So Eggert, after this game, losing to the Chargers, Herbert really dominating this matchup. Well, who do you really side with? Do you just go with Herbert and who will have more success down the line? Uh, I think Herbert will have a lot more success down the line. I think this game made it very clear. He's just a better overall quarterback. We've seen Justin Herbert have to deal with O-line issues. I had Brandon Staley as a coach of the year candidate before the season, but he's proven to not be one of the best coaches at all this season. So he's had a lot of coaching hurdles to go through. And defensively and offensively, Herbert has just had to battle countless injuries on the roster, but he's still finding a way to push this team forward in one of the toughest divisions outside of the Broncos this season. And I think it's just a clear talent difference, too, between Herbert and Tua. Not saying Tua has just completely peaked, because I think we should give him at least one more season to prove himself, but he showed that he can be handled. He showed that he can be contained. If you rush to it and don't give him the opportunity to even really think in the pocket, he's not that quick, bro. We've seen Justin Herbert get rushed several times and make plays happen. But the 49ers and the Dolphins show that if you keep him collapsed in the pocket, he's not making the throws like these other quarterbacks are making that we hold in high regard. So I think that's just the talent difference we've seen. And also Herbert has had to juggle a lot more with his organization. See, I think that is a complete overreaction to the past couple of weeks. Because when you look at the, the quarterback stats and the quarterback ratings of when Tua is pressured, I think he's the best quarterback when blitzed. So everybody's saying, oh, yeah, these past couple of weeks, he can't do anything when pressured. I think that's just an a, a outlier for these past couple of games. I think he's still good under pressure. I think Tua is still a good quarterback in this league. We cannot jump off a player because of two bad weeks. Because, goddamn, when we see Josh Allen had him three terrible weeks, we were still riding Josh Allen to the damn wheels come home. We got to have that same type of respect for Tua, bro, with the season that he was having before that. Tyreek Hill was having an MVP caliber season with almost, he's on track to have 2,000 yards. Waddle was going crazy. We cannot jump off the bandwagon because of two bad weeks. I think the Dolphins are still a good team. I think they're going to make a, a decent run in the playoffs, at least get a one win in the playoffs. We just can't jump off the Tua bandwagon because he's not as good as Herbert. I think that's the misconception. I think Herbert has solidified himself in that top five conversation. But we can't just say, oh, Herbert is so good and Tua is trash because that's not really how it is. Oh, Both of them yeah, are no. still good, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I don't want to make it sound like Tua is just completely below Herbert. I'm not I saying it's completely you, but I'm saying that's the conversation that's being had on these sports sites because a lot oh, of yeah, people yeah, were hating yeah. on Tua yeah. because of the first couple of seasons. The first couple of seasons, Tua t- looked trash. I'll, I'll say that. Tua did look trash. He was obviously going back and forth with Ryan Fitzpatrick. But this season, he really showed the true potential of what he can be. And he showed it for a strong sample size of eight games against good competition. He played against the Vikings. He played against the Bills. He played against the top teams in his division. He played against the Patriots and dominated. So he has two bad games, and we jumping off the bandwagon. It just doesn't make sense to me. 
Like, I understand that Herbert can be the best, but her, her Tua, I think, can still be in that top 10 conversation while Herbert is in that top five. I, I definitely think Tua, when every, when every quarterback is healthy, Tua is definitely still in the top 10 conversation. I just think talent-wise, I need to see him make that next jump. Because I haven't seen, I, I know we got a good sample size of him being able to beat good teams and play good. But for one, we know Tua now at this point, he's a quarterback where unless everything around him is A+, plus, we're not going to get the best version of Tua. And it's not his fault. It's a lot of quarterbacks like that that can still win games and can still get you to the chip. But we know Tua to be that at this point. If he doesn't have the best receivers possible, he's not just making it happen like our other QBs can. But he is still getting the job done, like you said. I just think I need to see him jump to that next level, be a lot better when it comes to the deep ball, and be a lot more accurate. He can hit these wide receivers because they can break open better than any other wide receivers in the NFL. But... What happens when you have DBs keeping up with these receivers? What happens when you have to throw into tighter windows? I want to see Tua make that jump to where I'm looking at him like, damn, you can make damn near any throw, and I just don't see that with Tua yet, whether that has to do with him being pressured or not. Because this is the thing with Tua. I don't think – I agree with you about the talent point. He doesn't have the same type of talent when it comes to deep throw accuracy. He doesn't have the same type of arm strength as somebody like – uh, Justin Herbert, but we knew that coming into the NFL that he was more so like a Drew Brees. Drew Brees didn't have a strong arm, but he can make every throw. He was accurate. And for most of this season, that's what Tua was. And for the past couple of weeks, when you talk about accuracy and completion percentage, Tua has really gone down the drain these past couple of weeks. I'll admit that. But these are against some good defenses. Well, San Francisco was a good defense. Uh, I have no excuse for the Chargers because the Chargers' whole secondary was hurt, and he still that's had this type of game. So this was just a terrible game from Tua, so I just got to chalk it up to that. But before this, he was the most accurate quarterback in the NFL. He was throwing everything was on a the dart. These last couple of weeks, I don't know what happened, but I'm not just going to let those these last two games just fog my memory of what I've seen in these first eight, you know what I'm saying, our first ten games. Right. Like, I'm not going to let that happen, you know what I'm saying? And when you talk about the future success of Tua and Herbert, I think that all still comes down to team because even though T Herbert could be the better quarterback, I think you still got to look at, the team. We know what the Chargers are at this point. Taz brought it up in the preseason, uh, the preview about how they always stay hurt. They can never be healthy. And we've seen that even with Herbert, they really can't stay healthy. Keenan Allen can never stay on the field. Mike Williams can never stay on the field. Something that I love about the, the Dolphins is that they're young and they're coming, bro. The defense will be better going forward. And the offensive pieces, you already have them in place. And I think they will just grow as time goes on. So when you talk about team success, and even individual success, I think Tour and, and Herbert will still be compared moving forward. I still don't think it will be just this giant gap where it's like, oh, Herbert is just that dominant guy. Tua can't even compare because the conversation that was being had this week was that, oh, Miami made a mistake by not picking Herbert. And you can, it's a case that can be made in that argument. But I don't think that's the case, bro. I think the, the Dolphins have the right quarterback for what they want to do, bro. I think with the quarterback, the wide receivers that you have in place, you have the right quarterback. Because in the first 10 games, he was the most accurate, precise quarterback. And this team was looking like world dominators, bro. The past two weeks, he's been slipping. But I like I, once again, I'm not going to let that fog my memory. I'm still on the tour train. He just has to get right. I'm assuming that uh, over these uh, next couple of weeks, they had softer competition. He will get right. But I, I'm not going to let it fall. I, I think him and Herbert will still be compared. I don't think it will just be this huge gap like everybody was rushing to say after this game was completed. You know what I'm saying? So I think we still got to hold our horses. I, I I think we got to hold our horses when it comes to the critiquing of Tua. I totally agree with that. But I think with Herbert, bro, he's – I don't even like comparing him to Tua because when I think Justin Herbert, I think – Josh Allen, I think, you know, um Joe Burrow. Like I'm thinking of that level. I don't know. We gotta what we level still got we still gotta really get there at. with the playoff success though. See, that's the thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, the playoff success. We can we can talk about happen. we can talk yeah. about the talent because he's up there when in terms of talent wise. I got once again, yeah, yeah. he's up there in that cream of the crop top five conversation. But everything that Joe Burrow, Mahomes, Josh Allen, they have playoff success, and that's something that Herbert and Tua still have to prove moving forward. And that's why that's I true. brought up the Dolphins still being young and upcoming and something about the Chargers, how it always feel like they're a cursed franchise when it comes to injuries. I feel, mm -hmm. I still think down the line, 
And even this season that the Dolphins will still have more success than the Chargers, even though the Chargers have the better quarterback. That's just how these two quarterbacks are situated right now. I still think Tua will have better team success, even though Herbert might have more accolades. Moving on to the next topic, we got the Lions versus the Vikings. The Lions had a huge win this weekend versus the Vikings. The Vikings were 10-2 and two going into Detroit. And the Lions honestly have won four games in a row. They're one of the hottest teams in the NFL. The offense is clicking on all cylinders. Jared Goff is looking like a top 15 quarterback. I, it's, it's not really a hot take to say that at this point. And uh, top 20, a top, top 15. 20. I mean, oh, he's, no. he's on. <laughs> and, it's, and it's something I was watching the game, bro. And they were talking about like his stats and the uh, statistics and the numbers that he's putting up this season. They were saying, like, if the defense was better, because the offense is one of the best offenses in the NFL. They yeah, were saying they, the I defense, think they're still leading in scoring. Yeah, like in passing offense, they're number one or number two. So they're still up there when you talk about offenses this year. They said Jared Goff would be getting way more credit than he is. But since they're six and seven, nobody's going to talk about the Lions. Nobody's going to talk about Jared Goff. But Jared Goff is having a quietly good season this year, and it is sliding under the radar. But what was your biggest takeaway from this game? Because you could talk about the Lions and how good they look, but you could also turn to the Vikings, a team where we, I feel like every week we have more questions or we get answered, then we still got more doubts about this team. What was your biggest takeaway? Uh, before I talk about the Lions, I do want to hit on that point about the Vikings. Majority of this season, if not all of this season, I've been hype on the Vikings like I have been the last couple of years. But again, they start to show me and others that mm, they're still the same old Vikings when it when the pressure continues to build or when the pressure is at its highest is a situation where they continue to fold. I'm not saying the pressure is high because you're playing the Lions, but because it's a division game, it's a game that I feel like if you're the Vikings, you need to win because the Lions are on a hot streak. This is something that you can't do, especially losing the way that they lost. Like they're they're losing games that I feel like they could win, but they just keep shooting themselves in the foot late in games. And if you're in a situation like that, if you're the Vikings who who have a negative point differential for majority of the game, I was about to say this isn't in. the only game that bro. The bro, I, I truly believe like, it the Vikings make are not as good as their record, bro. They're not as good as their record. It's been multiple games like this where they're in dog fights with teams that are not that good or, or teams that are good. But we didn't expect them to be in a dog fight. But, but I can talk but about they the have Giants big game. Moments, bro. Like they, they have, have a lot big of moments. big moments. They have and comebacks I think that's, too. That's that's a good that's thing. That's what matters. That's what matters mm -hmm. the most when it comes to the playoffs. Like nobody's gonna give a damn that you getting beat for three quarters. But can you make the plays that count? But is that a good thing with the negative the point dunk? differential, though, bro? We gotta no, no, talk it, about it's that. It's not a good. It's not a good thing when you when you get to the statistics of it. Because you're gonna you're gonna play better when you get to the playoffs. That that's what's kept the Vikings in some people's good graces this whole time of like, yeah, they're winning ugly majority of every week, but they're still winning. They're still finding ways to win. And I think we have to commend them for that on top of the fact we got to criticize, hey, you shouldn't be in a close game every week. I, I just think we have to give them some type of head and out of, hey, damn, bro, if it's a team that's going to win a close game, it's the Vikings. It's just recently – They've started to unravel, and to your point, I don't know how that's going to work in the playoffs when you got the Eagles and uh, the what's San called, Francisco, the, 40, the 49ers. Those are the two teams I'm worried about. If I'm the Vikings, if you're the if you're playing against the Cowboys, I don't see what happened this regular season happening twice. I could but, see it again, but I just feel like the Vikings they they don't have a chance if they're going to continue to unravel with their consistency for these last three to four weeks. And that's the thing with the Vikings, bro. You honestly don't know what you're going to get from a week-to-week -week basis, bro. And, and that's the thing. And we talked about it last year when they weren't that good. They were having the same type of games last year. When they were all they were uh, 500, they were like 8 and 9 probably. Mm -hmm. They were 500, but they were losing the close games. But this year... They were beating teams the they shouldn't have beaten. And the games yeah. that they should have won, they were probably getting blown exactly. out. And it's like, what's happening? Like, you didn't exactly. know what was happening. So we see a way better season this year, obviously being 10 and three, but it's still the same type of doubts, even with a better record of like, damn, is this shit going to work in the playoffs, bro? Because when we see y'all play playoff caliber teams that we know for sure are going to play, be in the playoffs, y'all have been dominated. I truly believe that. The, the, y'all play the Eagles, even though it was early in the season. 
Y'all got dominated. Did they, didn't they lose to the Cowboys as well early in the season? Yeah, they got blew out by the Cowboys. They got blew out by the Cowboys earlier in the season. So you got dominated by the two teams you know you're going to see there. The 49ers going to blast y'all even with a backup quarterback. So I, I just don't feel confident with this team. That's why even after that Bills win and everybody was all hype on Kirk and hype on the the the, the Vikings, it was still like, it's something about them that I just don't like, bro. They're in too many close. Now, it's not even the close games. It's just like, I don't trust that nigga Kirk, bro. And that defense yeah. isn't as good as a lot of people want to give them credit for, bro. That defense is susceptible to a lot of stuff. It's not like they're dominant in the uh, the past or with the secondary and they're giving up a lot on the run. They can be beaten either way. It's not like they have a dominant defense. It's really their offense that has been keeping them uh, their head above water because they have elite playmakers with Thielen, with Justin Jefferson, with Cook. And now you add Hawkinson to that. But the defense, I think, can give up a lot of yards. And then with the quarterback position, I question it. So even though they've been winning these big games, I still like I don't like something I don't like about them Vikings, man. They, this ain't gonna work in the playoffs, bro. I promise you, just not gonna work. You play the Eagles, and, you play the Niners, you play the Cowboys, you getting blasted. And when it comes to the Lions, if they can find a way to win majority of the rest of this season and make a playoff push, we have to ask that question right now because it's so late in the season. Are the Lions an NFC team that? The top teams, I'll say the top two to three teams, should they be worried about? Cowboys. If they're, one of the, if they're the Cowboys. highest scoring team, because yeah. they're, they're, they're either still the number one or top two leading scoring team in the league. Mm-hmm. And I think they um I think they get the most yards per game as well. So if you're the Cowboys or shit, even if you like the Seahawks or somebody they, like they that, play, they the played Lions the can Eagles. get to a second game. Because they played the Eagles earlier in the season, and it was a dogfight. I think I was yeah. week one or week two, and it was a high-scoring matchup. Like, bro, they have played good these best teams in the NFC and have been toe-to-toe with them because their offense is so good. So I believe they can play with anybody, and they're playing better. They're, they're, defensively, they've been playing better, too. You got to think about it, bro. Their last four games, they're, um, they're on the road for three out of four of these. But the Jets... The Panthers, the Bears, and the Packers. Those are their last They're four winning games. three. I think all, three. all four of these are winnable. I don't know if they'll win all four. They're winning three. All four are winnable. Mm-hmm. And, and that's crazy. So what is that, so nine you, and eight? Yeah, you nine and eight or ten and seven if you win all four. That's crazy. That's going to be crazy, I gotta see the rest. I got to see the rest of the NFC. I got to see the rest of the NFC. Crazy. If the Lions end their season nine and, nine and eight or ten and seven, that's going to be crazy. We got to be scared a little bit of the Lions if they end their season like that. Because currently... Dan Campbell might make a last-minute run for Coach of the Year if they if that shit happened. Because currently, the last three wild-card spots are the Cowboys at 10-3, and three, but the Cowboys are solidified. Then you got the Commanders and you got the Giants both sitting at 7-5-1. and one. So See, both, so I, I think the, the Lions can catch both of them. Yeah, because the Commanders yeah. and the Giants, you still got to play people in your division. Y'all can easily yep. knock each other out of the playoffs, and then you still got the Seahawks at seven and six, and then after that, that's when you got the Lions at six and seven. But I think there is an opportunity there, bro. There is easily an opportunity for them Lions to get there, and like I said, they've already played with the top teams like the Eagles and have played with them. Have has it had it go to the, the end of the game. I think they can play with the Vikings. We've already seen that they can beat the Vikings. I don't think they can beat the 49ers. I think that's too dominant of a defense. But I think they can beat the Bucks. I think they can beat the Cowboys. With that offense that they currently have in place, they can beat a lot of teams. They can pull an upset, bro. Because, whoa. Because if they were to get 9 and 8, I'm assuming they would be a 7 seed. Yeah, they and would, they would most likely They would most yeah. likely play the Vikings in the playoffs. <laughs> is that Damn. a Vikings upset first round? Right? <laughs> Damn. Because <laughs> because you look at the standings, the Vikings ten and three. I'm assuming I'm just gonna assume they stay at uh, at the second spot in the NFC. I mean, you got the 49ers at nine and four, but you know what I'm saying with a backup quarterback, potentially they could overtake that two seed. But the Vikings have no excuse to not win the last three out of four of their last games. They play the Colts this Saturday, then That's next good. week. For Christmas Eve, they play the Giants. That could be a L, but I'm going to get them the dub. Yeah, I'm messing up. And then they own the the last two games are on the road versus the Packers and then the Bears. That's four dubs. That's four dubs. It should it should be four. That Giants game, <laughs> they at the crib, but that Giants game, that's going to be the game. Nah, like, hey, see, I'm, I'm the, off that. I'm the, off that Giants bandwagon, bro. 
I'm not on the Giants bandwagon, but that's a game I need the Vikings to win to show everybody if to dominate. Real they need to yes. dominate that because that's the team you have to dominate against. Even though people mm-hmm. are falling off of the Giants bandwagon, the Giants are not a pushover team yet. They're still a exactly. team that hey, they can still beat somebody that's good enough to make the playoffs or even go to the Super Bowl if they want to. So if you're the Vikings, you have to win that Giants game. Because the thing about the Giants, we've seen it over the last few weeks. They've really tailed off when you talk about the record because I'm pretty sure they started off the season like 7-2. and two. It started off pretty hot. But the injuries have just piled on too thick for the, the, the Giants. They didn't have a lot of good wide receivers to start off the season with. And then all of the receivers that were actually being productive, they either traded away or they've gotten hurt like Wondell Robinson. I mean, Galladay was never giving you anything. Now you're relying on people like Richie James who was a free agent over the offseason and people like that to really produce. And so their passing game can't, can't get off the ground. And now they're putting eight, nine men in the box, daring Daniel Jones to make a play. And that's killing the whole Giants vibe. Their defense can still play with anybody because it's still a young and fiery defense, but the offense can't move the, the ball at all. bro. It can't move the ball. But so I, that's, that's the point where the Giants, I think the Giants will not make the playoffs and the Lions can easily take their spot. And you know what I'm saying? If they continue to win these games. So, yeah, that's something to continue to watch out for for sure. Moving on to the next topic, we got is Tom Brady gone in the offseason. So that is the talk of the town now. Everybody's seeing what's going on with the Bucks. They're six and seven. Uh, the Bucks haven't been looking that good. Honestly, Brady hasn't been looking that good. I'm not gonna put it all on the Bucks, but everybody's saying that he could potentially come back for one more season, maybe a couple of more seasons uh after this year. First, I want to get your reaction on him potentially coming back. And do you think he's gone and where he's going? Uh, I think he'll come back for one more year. I I just don't I don't see Brady leaving on a bad note with a bad taste in his mouth, bro. Like when he came, when he did the pump fake and said I'm retiring, and then said No, nah, I'm coming back. I told he gave y'all up his then, family I, for this. like he gave up his family for this. First <laughs> off, and then second off, I was telling people I'm like, bro. He either wants to win another. He he either wants to have an MVP season, or he wants to chill. Those are the only two ways he's gonna want to retire and like end his season. And I don't think the MVP grasp is there anymore. I don't think he he's just too old now to to really make that MVP run. So I think he's really just trying to see if he I can mean, get one. Yo, you mean this year or in years to come? I, I think even in years to come, bro. I don't. It don't matter I, what team. He hold on, on now. Bro, hold on now, because. Move, now move into your fits. Where do you think he could go in the offseason? A lot of people, a lot of people have been saying he can go to San Francisco because you know that's home. He's from the um he's from California in that Bay Area. But I don't think so because of the of the 49ers quarterback situation. They got too much. What is that draft quarterback capital. situation? They got what you, you call can, it? You, they can, got you trade. can trade Lance. You can get Jimmy a G up out of there. Brock Purdy, he a backup. I don't know, bro. I don't know what they that can, ease, the they can easily get rid of these future. quarterbacks that they have in place, bro. Easily. I, I don't know. Place. You got to think about your future if you're the 49ers. Like, I, I understand the, the importance of wanting to win now. Let's let's just do what we can to win now. But I don't know if Brady's at that point anymore where you could just throw all your chips down on him. I don't know that. I don't know if it can happen. And, and, with him and like that's that. a good point. And that's a good point. And that's why. This whole conversation of Tom Brady leaving in the offseason is kind of a tricky one for me. Because if y'all have been looking at these last two, three goddamn games, Brady been looking like some shit, dog. I know that everybody going to blame the wide receivers for not getting open. Brady been looking like some shit. It's not these wide receivers. It's not the offensive line. It's partly offensive line. But that nigga Brady been looking like some shit. So I think if he goes to somebody like San Francisco, I think he doesn't have to make the, the plays that he has to in Tampa Bay, he doesn't have to create as much because you have so many playmakers on the field where it's like, damn, I can hand the ball off to Christian fucking McCaffrey. I can easily do a jet sweep with Debo Samuel. I got Brandon Ayuk. I got one of the best tight ends in the league in George Kittle. The weapons over there are just different. When he got to Tampa Bay, those weapons that he had when they prom and they were really ready to go. But now Mike Evans getting older. He don't have the same effect. Chris Godwin, we see him piling up with the injuries. Maybe it is good for Brady, even though he hasn't been looking the same for him to go to a place where the weapons are at an excess like they are in San Francisco. Like I said, I think that quarterback situation over there can change quickly. 
I think you can trade somebody like Trey Lance. I think Jimmy G is already a free agent after this, this season. And then uh, Brock Purdy, he, he could easily be your backup. He's been playing solid these last couple of games. If you want to keep him around, you can. Because I think um, another team people have been bringing up is the Las Vegas Raiders. You know, Derek Carr's future in Las Vegas has been up in the air. And he has a potential out in his contract for this year. He's not an unrestricted free agent until 2026. But he has a potential opt-out year for this um, for this coming year in 2023. So if you're Derek Carr and you're looking for a better situation to go to because the Raiders just have not been working for you this entire time, and if you're the Raiders organization, do you make that push to put Brady back with um, – Josh McDaniels, that quarterback, offensive coordinator, now head coach duo, and you give Derek – and Derek Carr chooses, you know, to walk into Tampa Bay in a sense. You know, I, I don't know. Could that work? But outside of San Francisco and Las Vegas – It's not too many too options. Many other teams. It's, it's not too many, many options. options for Brady. It's not too many options. Especially with this quarterback class, or the, the trash years are going to get their quarterbacks. And everybody has their quarterback for the most part. Everybody right? has we're their in guy. A, everybody in, has their future. That's what I'm saying. We're in an era where all of the good teams have their quarterback. It's not really a team where you can say, like, damn, if they had a quarterback. You know what I'm saying? Because we said that same shit about Denver a, a year ago. They got their quote-unquote guy in Russell Wilson. And we see it how that situation turned out. That nigga Russell Wilson can't get shit moving. So that shit could be overrated. You don't want to dive into a situation like he just dove in. He signed a contract and now he's stuck there. So Brady has to really take his steps really lightly. Make sure you can go to the place that you want before you saying, okay, I'm going to leave Tampa Bay or I'm going to uh, go against the retirement thing. Make sure that San Francisco thing is op uh, open and make sure. I don't think that Vegas one is a good one, honestly. I, I honestly think it's San Francisco or bust. Yeah, I don't you think can't it go to either. San Francisco. I deserve it. Yeah. If that San Francisco one ain't open, he need to sit his ass down, bro. Truthfully. I don't think he should come back to the Bucks. I think he looks tired and fed up with the coaching staff in Tampa Bay. So I do think he will leave Tampa Bay either for retirement or for San Francisco. I don't think there's any other option other than San Francisco or retirement. I really think that's it. If I'm San Francisco, bro, like I said, I'm not. I'm just not putting all my chips in on Tom Brady, bro. Like, bro, finna be what, 45? Like, come on, bro. Like, I'm not putting all my – I know he the GOAT. I know in even in games now, he can still have flashes and two-minute drills to where it's like, damn, he can really get it done. But for majority of every game this season, it's just been hard to watch, bro. And if you're hard to watch, team, bro. If you're any team out there, you can't – you cannot seriously sit there and say, yeah – We'll put it all on the line to get Brady to try to get a chip. Like, no, he's not at that point anymore. He's at a point to where if you can get him for a reasonable amount and he can help you get to the chip, that's cool. But is he somebody I'm risking future draft picks for? Hell no. No, 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 no. Not if, I need him. He not if I really yeah, he... need him. Because this is the thing about San Francisco. I don't think, I don't think, uh, what's my man name in San Francisco? Uh, Shanahan. I don't think Shanahan like Trey Lance, bro. I don't think he wants him to be his quarterback. I think when that, because uh, Calher was talking about this a minute ago, like Trey Lance is really not Shanahan's style of quarterback, bro. His style of quarterback is the Matt Ryan, the Jimmy Garoppolo, stand in the pocket, make the correct throws, hand the ball off, game manager type of quarterbacks that can do a little more than that. Trey Lance is a quarterback who doesn't stand in the pocket. He wants to run more than he wants to stand in the pocket. That's not really his style of quarterback. And 20... In 2020 or 2019, whenever Trey Lance was drafted, he wanted – Shanahan wanted Mac Jones. You heard all those rumors that Mac Jones was going to go to San Francisco. He wanted Mac Jones because Mac Jones is his style of quarterback. Stand in the pocket, make all the throws necessary. Trey Lance was the, the pick from the front office and the, the other scouts, but if he I don't think he's Shanahan's guy. I think if Brady becomes available – Brady is that style of quarterback that Shanahan likes and can work with and has a track record with. I think he will pick him and would trade Trey Lance for a first round pick or whatever he can get for Trey Lance because I don't think Trey Lance is his guy. So you talk about the future, that's cool, but I still don't think that's his style of quarterback anyway. I still don't but see But you still got Brock Purdy Lance. too. You still got But that's Brock what I'm Purdy. saying. Cuz that's what I'm saying though. Brock Purdy going to stay. Brock going to stay because, shit, after Brady going after the season or two in San Francisco, Brock Purdy stepping in. You know what I'm saying? Because that's why I said you getting rid of Jimmy G and you getting rid of Lance. Purdy still going to be there. He an undrafted free agent. So that you sign that nigga to anything, he going to sign on the dotted line. 
So I think he's still going to be certified your backup, and that can be your future if you believe in Purdy that way. But Brady, I think, can put you over the top, especially he's he's a better Jimmy Garoppolo. You already know he has the proven track record. You've been to a Super Bowl with Jimmy G. Imagine what you can do with these weapons and with that defense with Tom Brady. Even though he hasn't been looking this good in parts this season, God damn, with these weapons that consistently get open? I don't even have to make that. I don't even have to think that much. This offensive line, that defense, shit. It feels like when he first went to Tampa Bay and everybody was like, damn, he got everything he need. It's going to be like that times 10, I feel like, because that defense, I feel like it's on another level. Yeah, that, that these defense weapons, crazy. That defense crazy. And think about the, you got one of the best running backs in the league. You got one of the best wide receivers in the league. And then you got one of the best tight ends in the league. And then you got one of the best left tackles in the league in Trent Williams. You can't go to a better situation than San Francisco. You got one That's of the best we... head coaches. And Kyle you got Sanders. one of the best <laughs> who has a track record of winning. He won and, with Jimmy G. Record he won in Atlanta. Of true quarterback progression, which is all. Come on, good. bro. I'm telling you, the, the, th- the, the signs are there for San Francisco. You know what I'm saying? I don't think Trey Lance is their guy. I think if Brady is available, if Brady wants to leave, San Francisco is his only option. His only option. Either that or retirement. Because if and he stays on. with us, bro, I would be very shocked. I would, I would be, be very shocked. shocked if he stays with us. Because I'd be like, oh, do you want to waste your career? Because everybody, because even Mike Evans don't look the same, bro. He don't got that same burst no more, bro. I don't know what it is about Mike. But Mike is 30, though, so you would think that, that would come eventually. Mike in, like, year, next year, he's going to be year 10? He's going to be 10 But that's 10. what I'm saying. Why would you want to stay there if you see him? It's like when LeBron was staying with, uh, in Miami. He's seen D-Wade get older. He's seeing Bosh start to not play as well. It's like, damn, why am I staying in a place where I'm seeing everything dying around me when I can win? I can still have a chance to win championships in a better place. You know what I'm saying? I think that's opportunity is still available to Brady right now. So I think it's there. And moving on to the NFL Week 15 preview. Now, what we got for games of the week for this week? We got this week. Uh, we got some Saturday games. We're getting to the end of the season. So we got Seahawks and 49ers for Thursday. That might be a good game. I got the 49ers winning. That might be a pretty decent Thursday night game, though. Uh, some division games. We got Ravens and Browns on Saturday. Uh, Dolphins and Bills on Saturday. That's going to be a good one. Damn, we got uh, Saturday games. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah. Colts and the Vikings. That's a one o'clock Saturday game. Vikings should win that. Uh, what's a? I don't good really see game? any more games. The hey, the Cowboys on upset alert. Hey, them Jags might come in and fuck some shit up. I don't know. Yeah, it was in a dog fight with them Texans this week. Chargers and Titans. That'll be a good Ooh, one, I think. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Bucks and Bengals. I ain't gonna say that's gonna be a good one. <laughs> I just hope we don't get our ass whooped. Hey, no, that Giants and Commanders game going to be good, though. We just seen them play a couple of weeks yeah, ago. They fight Obviously, it ended in a tie. And they yeah. want to make the playoffs, too. So that's going to be a dog fight. Giants and Commanders might be game of the week for, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be game of the week right there, Giants and, uh, and Commanders. And let's move on to the picks of the week. Starting off with Thursday night football, we got the 49ers and Seahawks. The 49ers are a three-and-a-half-point favorite on Bovada. Uh... I ain't gonna lie, I probably have him as a seven point favorite, but yeah, yeah I got the 40, Seahawks. I got 49ers on the road. Yeah, I for sure got 49ers. Colts versus Vikings. Uh, Vikings. Yeah, I got the Vikings. That gotta be a that gotta hike. That hike, you gotta be a dominant game too, a little bit. That too. has to be a blowout. It has to be. Yeah, that's that shouldn't be close either, bro. Uh, Ravens versus Browns. Uh, Deshaun been letting me down. I thought by at least the second game, he'll be on some shit. But Bro, Deshaun I'm not going to be the same until next year. He ain't going to be Deshaun until yeah. next year, I truly feel it. And shout, shout out to the Ravens, because they're finding ways to win, bro. I thought when Lamar went down, oh, hope will be gone. I mean, as far as Super Bowls, yes, hope is gone at this point, as long as Lamar is not on the damn football field. But shout <laughs> out to the Ravens for still finding ways to win. So I got the Ravens on the road. Yeah, that was a tough win. Speaking of that Ravens game, bro. If y'all watched that Ravens versus Steelers game, that was honestly that, that game was a hard game to watch. Oh, yeah. But yeah, Mitch yeah. Trubisky, bro. Mitch Trubisky. How the hell did this nigga still have a job, bro? That's what I don't I'm like saying. the break. I, this is this is the thing. This is the thing. This is the thing. 
I don't want to bring up Cam in this situation. No, I'm bringing Cam up Cam every time. No, 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 no. Because you know, you already time. know how I feel, bro. That's a touchy subject for me, bro. That's a touchy subject for me. I'm bringing up but Cam. But a nigga like Cam not in the time. league when you got trash ass Mitch Trubisky doing what he did on Sunday, throwing three picks every time he threw the goddamn ball up. It was a goddamn almost pick. Come on, though. That was a terrible game. And Mr. Trubisky is just in that tier where he's not a good quarterback, but he's still in the league. Come on, man. Nathan Peterman still bro. getting chances. We got people like Nathan Peterman, Mitch Trubisky, Josh Johnson. I thought Josh Johnson was working at T-Mobile <laughs> somewhere or something. I didn't even know this man was still in the damn league. I remember Josh Johnson from Josh Freeman days. Yeah. When he was backing up Josh Freeman. When I, I thought at that moment Josh Johnson should have been the starter. But that's a conversation for another day. But you got people like Josh Johnson, Mitch Trubisky, Matt Ryan is showing that he's cooked at this point. <laughs> Who, who else name did I hear this past? Colt McCoy, bro. Like, people oh. that hear this, like, what the hell? Like, I didn't even know these people were still playing. But Cam Newton can't play? And this is why I was so mad with some of them people at my job, bro. When they was just like, yeah, of course I'll take Trubisky over Cam. Like, no, y'all are not watching football, bro. If y'all could just sit here and easily say that all of these quarterbacks I'm naming are just better than Cam Newton, no. Cam ain't in the lead because of reasons we won't talk about that we already know. But I just want to point out Cam Newton should be in the league if we got trash-ass people like Mitch Trubisky still getting starting jobs if he was to go to another team right now, which is crazy. And this is the thing, because you you know you already know how I feel about Cam. Obviously, he's my favorite player of all time. But the last couple of years, he did not play well. I would admit that he played trash this last year in Carolina. But when you got niggas like Trubisky in the league, Doing basically what Cam did last year when every time he threw that bitch, it was a pick. Like, goddamn, Cam should be on somebody roster. Somebody exactly. got to give him a chance. Somebody should be slipping my nigga a paycheck. You know what I'm saying? Now we got to start having a conversation of, is the NFL trying to blackball Cam or does Cam just not want to be in a position where he is a backup? And I think that could high key be the conversation that we have more yeah, so that's, than that's part he's not too. getting these opportunities. Yeah. I don't think Cam wants to be a backup. You know what I'm saying? If it's not a starting opportunity available to him, I don't think he wants it. You know because he's seen the people that are starting, and he's like, <laughs> no, if I'm playing just as people, why do I have to be a backup, but they get to be starters? Like, that doesn't make sense to me, bro. Matt Ryan, we thought he was going to go to the Colts and make some shit shake. Matt Ryan has been trash. We have not mentioned yeah. that man name at all this season unless we were making fun of him. Like, there are people starting in the league now. There's people being in the league that just suck. Like, if people was trying to say Colt McCoy did decent getting in the game this past week, I'm like, Colt, nobody has film on Colt McCoy. If Colt <laughs> McCoy completes any goddamn pass, it's because niggas forgot he was in the league. The defense yeah. was probably like, damn. And he was never was, good. I thought that boy was working at Papa John's. That's probably what the defense <laughs> was saying. I thought Josh Johnson was at T-Mobile or some shit. Man. <laughs> bro, why, why Papa John's of all places is crazy, bro. Know, bro. Papa John's of all places is crazy, dog. The, the official but yeah. <laughs> that shit God, is nuts. Damn. But uh, but yeah, man, I just seen that damn Trubisky in the Steelers game, and I said, damn, you got trash ass Trubisky in the league. And my nigga Cam can't get an opportunity. That shit crazy. But uh moving on to did I already pick uh I got the Vikings for that coach Vikings, uh Ravens and Browns. I say Ravens. Okay, yeah, I got... The Browns are honestly a three-point favorite, and they're at home for this game. This is Saturday at 4.30. Fuck that, Mm. Ravens. This this (laughs) honestly depends on if Lamar plays, bro. From what I've seen in that Steelers game... Now watch this is gonna be the game with the this is gonna be the game with Deshaun John. I mean Deshaun on um, Watson just take off, but I'm picking. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm kind of. Yeah, I got the I got the Browns. I'm rolling with the Browns. I gotta start making more bold picks. I'm down with the picks. Uh, Hell no, nah. I got year. real. I gotta start making bold. Week. <laughs> I got real bold last week, and I ended up with a Sean type of record. <laughs> I gotta start making some bold picks to catch up. I got I got the Browns. Dolphins versus Bills. Uh. Hmm. I got the Dolphins on the road. This is supposed to be a snowy game, and that's what's scaring me, bro. Because this was a situation, and the, the situation I had a problem with when it came to the Vikings come playoffs. Not the Vikings, but the mm-hmm. Dolphins come playoff time. 
of when y'all in that cold weather, are y'all ready for it? Because this shit, damn sure ain't Florida. This ain't the same type of game that you can run when you're in Florida. Well, I know Tyreek ready. You can... I know Tyreek Hill ready. Yeah. That's all I know. Mm. Ah, damn. I got the bills, bro. I think that snow is going to affect them. And it, it's going to be tough because more people are going to pile on Tua because he will lose this game. But I still believe in Tua wholeheartedly. But I got the bills. Chiefs versus Texans. Uh, Chiefs. Chiefs for sure. Cowboys versus Jags. Um, mm. Do I want to do it? Damn, do I want to do it. I got the Jags. I got the Jags. I'm going to go with the Cowboys. I ain't going to get too crazy. I got the Cowboys. I got the Jags. Eagles versus Bears. Eagles. Eagles for sure. Falcons versus Saints. Oh, damn. Ugh. It's funny because both of these teams are trash, five and eight, four and nine, that's but they still have saying. a chance to win the division. <laughs> and that's the funniest part about these two teams. I can't <laughs> they even still say can win tie. The division. <laughs> I can't even say tie. Damn. Uh, I got wow. the Falcons. I, I was say, I really don't know. I d- you gotta go. You gotta go with the Saints just off of what you be saying about you never gonna pick the Falcons. God damn. Uh, give me the Falcons. Oh my God! I can't believe I'm saying this. Give me the Falcons. They gonna lose now. I wanted your ass to pick because <laughs> when you pick <laughs> against them niggas, they win. Now they gonna lose. Give me the now. Falcons. <laughs> we got the Lions versus the Jets. Ooh, that might be another game of the week right there. Top offense versus top defense. I'm going to go with the Lions, bro. I'm going to ride that wave. I'm going with the Lions. Damn. This one also depends on who is healthy. If Mike White plays, I think the Jets win. But he has a whole rib situation. Edgar was telling me before the pod that he was clear to play. But still, is he going to be the Mike White that we've been seeing over the past few weeks? Yeah. Mm. It's a one-point spread on Bavada. I still take the Jets. Steelers versus Panthers. Uh, Steelers. Actually, nah, give me the Panthers. I got the Panthers. I about to say. Yeah. Because the Panthers have already won too many games. I've been picking against them the whole season, and now look where we are. <laughs> We're one game out of first place in the division right now because we stumbled into this shit. So, I don't know. I'll, yeah, I'll give, give me the Panthers. Yeah. I got the Panthers. Cardinals versus Broncos. Ugh. Uh, you got Russ going down with concussions. You got my man Kyler going Kyler down Murray with not playing. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, man. this is going to be an ugly game, bro. This is going to be this ugly. Games. I'm riding out with Vegas. Colt McCoy. I'm riding out with Papa John Colt, man. You tripping. Yeah, go ahead. Give me the Cardinals. <laughs> Give me the Cardinals. Patriots. <laughs> Patriots versus Raiders. Give me the Pats. You already know what the Raiders going. Raiders going to be up by double digits in this game. They're going to get came back on. Same old story every week. Give me the Raiders. <laughs> Setting yourself up for this. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then you going to come on the pod next week talking about, damn, I knew this shit was going to happen, but you picked them though, nigga. <laughs> Bengals versus Bucks. Give me the Bengals versus Bengals. Bucks. I'm I'm not going to do it to myself again. Give me the Bengals. <laughs> Definitely the Bengals. <laughs> Titans versus Chargers. Game of the week, apparently, for 425. Uh, give me the Chargers. My boy Herbert again. I'm going with him. Yeah, I'm walking out with the Chargers for this one. Giants versus Commanders. Mm. Uh, uh, I got Giants on the road for Sunday Night Football. I got the Commanders. Chase Young should be back this week. Uh, they've, they're coming off a of bye week as well. So uh, Heineke is back, obviously. Uh, McLaurin is going to be healthy. Brian Robinson. I got the commander. Sunday night football for that one. And the last game, Monday night football, is Rams versus Packers. <sighs> Trash can. Can Baker Mayfield do it again? <laughs> can he upset Can he upset Aaron Rodgers? I was to say, is A-Rod playing? Yeah. Because I thought, um, well, no. Nah, because he I played against the Bears. He played against the Bears. What was that, a week ago or two weeks ago? 
I don't know if they've announced if the Packers are still in playoff contention or not, though. I think they're clearly out of it, but they haven't announced it yet. Because I was hearing a lot of people say, they're I was hearing a lot of people say they should um they should start Jordan Love if they're completely out of the playoff picture. And I that said that shit before they was even out of the playoff picture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do not trust Baker Mayfield to do that shit twice. Um, <laughs> yeah, give me the Packers. I don't even care who's playing quarterback. I'm not picking Baker. Yeah, I got the Packers, man. I ain't even going to fool myself. I need these Ws. All right, <laughs> moving on to the hey, NBA. Hey, Baker, listening to this right now. <laughs> he like, I right. swear I get that. <laughs> Watch how that nigga fold. Because, hey, when he the most <laughs> confident, that's when he fuck up. When he the most confident. Everybody was counting that nigga out, so that's why he won. When niggas start to expect some shit, he gonna fold. All right, and moving on to the NBA topics, bro. All hell, the new king of the NBA, Jason Tatum? I think it's starting to become a track record. And I think after this last finals appearance, even though Tatum didn't play as well, I think Tatum is starting to take that crown for the, the next king of the NBA. And I think we've seen the passing of the torch last night in that Lakers versus uh Celtics game. That was one hell of a game. If y'all missed that game, that was that was an excellent game. The Celtics yeah. were up the most of the game. They were up by 20 at one point. The Lakers ended up storming back, getting a double-digit lead with like three minutes left. And then Tatum and the Celtics ended up coming all the way back, getting it to overtime. And Tatum ended up with 44 points. Brown ended up with like 25. But in that game, he had hit some crucial shots over LeBron James. And it felt like a passing of the torch. Because we know this it has to come a new king of the NBA. LeBron is starting to get ushered out of the league. The, uh, the Lakers aren't going to do anything when, you, when we talk about the playoffs. I think Jason Tatum, he's at the head of the MVP conversation. He's obviously solidified himself as a top five to seven player in this league. I think... He is the new king of the NBA, bro. Over the Giannis's, over the Lucas, and all the upcoming kings, I think he is the next one. I think Jason Tatum is it. I can't deny that at this point. Um, I know when we had the argument, well, not even the argument, the debate, uh, it was this was like two years ago, I want to say, whether we thought it would be Luka, Tatum, Ja, like Zion, all these different people. Quincy's been saying Tatum for majority of this time. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be Luca, but we definitely are seeing now that it's Jason Tatum who's second, like the full fledged front of that debate right now. So I I can't argue against that at the moment. And like you said, with the passing of the torch, the way we saw him not only beat LeBron in LA, but the way he beat LeBron in LA, hitting that shot on him. You know, with a Kobe type of move with the turn around, <laughs> fade away and everything. Like, it was just, it was a beautiful thing to see because it's like, you see Bron is in that Kobe stage now of his career where it's like, players just want to beat you because of who you are. It ain't even got nothing to do with, like, they don't like you or, you know, they don't want to see your team do well or whatever. It's just, they want to play their best game against you now and that nine times out of ten, they're gonna win on top of playing their best game against you now. So mm-hmm. I it's a beautiful thing to see, regardless of what player would have ended up taking his mantle. But I, I can't deny right now that it's it has to be Jason Tatum at this point until I see otherwise. And it's funny because you can go back to 2017 when Tatum came into the league when he ended up banging on Braun in that Eastern Conference Finals game seven. Every everybody always brings that up. But we've seen the early signs of him going toe-to-toe with him in 2017. And now, fast forward five, six years later, now they're going toe-to-toe on a legitimate basis. They're both one of the best players in the NBA. But we're just seeing a transition now of one player descending and one just ascending to that great height that I don't think a lot of people are going to get to, bro. I know he had that rough NBA Finals, bro, but he came back this season, and he's on a mission, bro. I don't. I don't think Tatum is gonna fold like he did last year in the finals. I think he's he's got something to prove this year, bro. Two players that you know we always say you really got to prove yourself against KD and Braun, and KD still young enough to where he ain't got to let shit happen. And he like already that. showed KD what's up. Yeah, he that's what I, I'll said. clap your ass and whoop your ass, nigga. So <laughs> he locked KD up and swept him out of the first round of the playoffs. 
and then you do what you just did. LeBron, in a, I mean, it was a regular season game, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but it was still a game that everybody glued their eyes to and consider that one of the best games this season so far. So you, you beat both players in monumental ways in their own way. Like, I don't – and you're one of the best players right now, 25 or younger. I, I can't deny it right now. It, it has to be Jason Tatum. And a lot of people would break up that Jason Tatum, he hasn't won any rings. You can't call Jason Tatum the king of the NBA. We was calling LeBron king way before he ended up winning titles. So I don't want to hear that argument that you need rings to be called the king of the NBA. I know Giannis is the – it can be in that conversation for best player in the NBA, him, Tatum. Luca, Yoga, they're all up in that conversation, but I don't think there's a criteria that comes with the king. I think LeBron, we've shown that he, he was just dominant. He had a dominant run, and we just seen that he was going to be it. And I think Tatum is having that same type of run where, oh, he's going to run the league for the next 10 years. And I think he's starting it up right now. We've seen that him, he got to the finals, him and his boys, and he's going to continue to be that presence that everybody has to go through in the Eastern Conference. And that's what, you know what I'm saying? Now he has to, yeah, go ahead. And and he's going to have people that, you know, you can debate it with, you know, along the entire way. And I think that was, Mm -hmm. that's what makes it so fun because with LeBron, you know, people love saying, well, there was a point where KD could have, you know, had the title or Curry or this person, that person, you can throw those names into the mix. But at the end of the day, we know who ran that decade. We know who mm-hmm. everybody wanted to be, and we know who the goal was every single season. It was LeBron James. And I think Tatum will get to that point. Giannis, I can't argue if anybody has Giannis at that position right now because Giannis actually got a chip now. Tatum still doesn't. So if anybody can hold an argument to Tatum right now, it's only Giannis. Because of the fact he has a chip, and because of the fact that a hey, he's damn near the most dominant player in the league right now. So outside of Giannis, I I agree is is really Jason Tatum, and that's probably going to be the person that we have that. Yeah, argument with that's what I'm thinking time. too, bro. That's going to be like y'all going to be the two that's going to be uh, every Eastern Conference and Finals, y'all two. I think John Morant is going to have that Curry effect to where. Like I was always Braun and KD and then Curry started sliding in there. I think John Morant is going to have that effect of, and we always talking about Tatum and um, Giannis, but y'all slowly creeping up in there like, hey, I'm in this conversation too. I ain't ready to hop on the train yet, even though he may not be the face or the king of the NBA moving forward, but he's going to be the, at least the number three name that we're always talking about. I think he has the potential to be. Now, I don't think he could be the king of the NBA, but I think he can be the marketing face. I think he's already the one of the yeah. most exciting players. When you talk about box office, everybody says their jaw is their favorite p- player to go watch because they give him that yeah. Derrick Rose element, the, the exciting dunks, that type of thing. But when you talk about king, when you talk about the NBA has to run through this player, it's honestly between Giannis and Tatum, bro. And that's it. And right now, it's between those two. And outside of that, you can't talk about Luka. I don't think it's going to run through Luka. I think Luca has his own challenges to deal with. Yeah, the, and, with and I was wrong about Luca. I, I was wrong about Luca. I don't I don't think it can be Luca at this point. I but I wasn't wrong in a sense of an international player being the face of the NBA. I think it's I think it was just the fact that I was saying it for Luca and not Giannis. Because that was an argument I was having too for those of y'all who were listening to us when we had this original debate. I was saying we're going to run into a point where an international player, a player not born or raised in the U.S., could be the face of the league, which is which is crazy because it's never we've never had one before. We've never had a country person be the face of the NBA, and Giannis can be that person. I know Giannis is black, so we be forgetting that man from Greece, but that man is not from here. Like that man is all the way from the other side of the world. I think it's just with Luca. Is it's the fact that he's white on top of not being from here, as opposed to mm-hmm. with Giannis, we could easily forget. Like it's just we just feel like Giannis is from here, but we got to remember he's an international player. So I wasn't wrong in that sense because Giannis could definitely be the face. I was just wrong about it being Luca. Yeah, yeah, man. But it's gonna be exciting next decade, bro. Because I really think it'll just be between those two players, man. I think Tatum is really the next king of this NBA shit, man. We've had the debates, but I think it's becoming way more clear, you know what I'm saying, as the years go on. And moving on, we got to talk about Joel Embiid, bro. 
I know every year he's in the MVP conversation, but what he's doing right now and the run that the Sixers have been going on, it feels like Harden and Embiid are also starting to figure it out too. You know what I'm saying? The Sixers were even winning games without those two when Harden was out for a month with injuries and Embiid was out for a few games. Their bench players were really starting to figure things out and were still winning games without them. But now when everybody's coming back, uh, Embiid just came back, uh, Harden has come back now from his hamstring injury. We're seeing everything start to come to. It was a hamstring. I think it was a foot injury. But we're seeing everything come together for MB right now. I think he has a couple of 50-point games mixed in. So I'm going to read off his last seven games. So since November 28th, he's put up 38-7, and 19, 6-6, and 35-11-8, 39-7-3, 38-12-5, 53-12-3, and 31, 7, and 2. He's averaging 36. 33. Over, he's averaging oh, 33. Oh. Now, for the yeah. season, but or during this stretch, he's averaging 37 over this stretch of games since November 28th. Dominating the lead. So, obviously, Jason Tatum is at the top of the MVP conversation with Giannis. You also can throw D-Book and Zion in that conversation. But we cannot overlook what Embiid is doing. And also, on a grand scheme point of view, are the Sixers figuring it out with the Harden and Embiid thing? Uh, I think they are. Um, Joel Embiid, to your point, he's leading the team in literally every category except steals. Like, he's leading the league, not the lead, but the 76ers in points, rebounds, assists, and blocks. So he's leading the team in literally every damn category. I think he's scoring at this point at 33 points for the season, if I'm not mistaken. Unless you can name anybody he, else. He probably is. Yeah, he probably is. Let me look at I was going to say, yeah. I, don't, I don't think nobody else scoring that high right now. Um, Harden, uh, he's scoring 22 and 3 and 4, I think. So they're finally gelling. Harden, Harden is figuring out his role in facilitating and just getting the buckets when necessary, being a lot more clutch. When we did our um rankings for who we thought the playoff teams were going to be for the East and West, I had the 76ers, I think, like third or fourth. I had them pretty high, and I remember Quincy asking me if I was sure in it. At the time, I was, but when the season started off, I was like, uh, damn, are they going to let me down or whatever? But they've really grown into the team that I was projecting them to be before the season started. Right now, they're fifth. I, I probably had them either fourth or fifth when I gave my ranking. Yeah, and I, I think, think I had they could definitely pass the Nets. They can pass the Nets for sure when it's all said and done. We're going to talk about the Nets too, but what, yeah, I think Harden and Embiid are figuring out, but I think it's a little easier over this stretch of games, this last seven games, because Maxi hasn't been playing. And that's the that's the player that throws a wrench in this whole equation. If it was just a two-man game between Embiid and Harden, I think the process would be a, a lot easier. But since you have such a dynamic player in Maxi, you don't want to have him just off the ball, not using his talents to his fullest potential. And that's where everybody, that's when a lot of people can get caught standing around. So we got to see how the Sixers play when he returns from his injury to fully grasp what the Sixers can be. Because if they do the same shit that they were doing in the beginning of the season when he returns, it's like, oh, this is the same old Sixers. But that's that's the final ingredient. If they continue to do well when he comes back, then we can really jump on like, oh, this Sixers might actually cause some havoc come playoff time. But for right now, we got we have to wait to him. But in terms of the bench playing better, I think De'Anthony Melton, I said it before the season, De'Anthony Melton was a, a hell of an addition getting him from Memphis. He's been playing great. Shake Milton has been playing good minutes. I mean, Montrez has even been giving good minutes. Everybody in terms of that bench is playing good. And that's something that they didn't have last year. They had no bench. After they put the starters out, the bench was terrible. But this year, the, the, the bench is playing way better this year. And that's something else that we also have to look out for. But this is also a Doc Rivers team, so I'm not going to get too excited. So I'm going to just move on <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> Moving on to the next topic I got. Why is the Western Conference upside down, bro? When you look at the Western Conference, you got the, the Pelicans, who I love, are at number one. You got the Grizzlies at number two, the Nuggets at three, Suns at four, Trailblazers five, Clippers six, Kings seven, and the Jazz at eight. And then you got the usual suspects like the Mavericks, the Warriors. I wouldn't say the Timber Timberwolves are usual suspects, but they made the playoffs last year. And then you also yeah. have the Lakers out of the playoff picture right now. 
You know what I'm saying? So why is the Western Conference upside down right now? Are we seeing a changing of the guard? Are we seeing the younger teams starting to transition? Are these teams that we're used to getting older and getting out of the lead? Like, what, what is the issue that we're seeing? I think all three that you said, for sure. Um, I know with the Warriors, the Warriors aren't really in a rebuilding stage, but they're not in a, they're not in a dynasty form anymore either. I think they're just, uh, hey, if they win this year, they win this year. If they don't, we understand the the tribulations that they're going through right now with developing new players. So with the Warriors, it's no excuse for them to be out of playoff pictures at this point, but I understand them not being at the top right now. Like with the Pelicans, the Pelicans, hey, it's been a long time coming. Their talent is actually risen to the occasion. Everybody's healthy. Did we see them winning eight out of 10 games, like every 10 game stretch right now. No, we probably didn't see that, but we did see them being a more, well, at least Quincy anyway, saw them being a way more formidable threat. But I think that's what it is, bro. Like we're seeing a shift right now in the teams that we're used to seeing. Like, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's good that. I think it's good too. Yeah. I think it's good. We're not sitting here saying the same three to four teams that we've been saying the last three years, because now we're at that point where we need to see the Pelicans be better. We need to see the Trailblazers finally do something since changing it up around Damian Lillard. Like, time for these other teams, the Kings. The Kings have been trashed for however the fuck long, <laughs> but now they're finding their own rhythm. They may not even do anything in the playoffs if they stay in the playoff picture, but damn, the Kings making the playoffs after how many damn years? 25. I like the power yeah I, I like the power shift that's happening right now did we expect it no are we necessarily happy about it yes because it's different it, it opens up more teams to be talked about first off we're not saying you're talking about but it's not going to happen <laughs> but i i like it i like the fact that you know the young stars are showing that hey it's their time now and it feels weird because the players we it does. grew up watching like we're like I don't I don't know how to feel. It's like Kawhi. I don't know if his career over at this point. Bron old as hell. No, they, they still KD, they still straight. KD on I the think, wayside. Like I, don't I think a lot of these older teams are just trying to get into the groove of the season. But we're seeing these young teams get off to a better start because they're hungrier. They're ready to prove themselves. So we're seeing and they can be on the whole prove. season. They exactly. Can be these old, like the the I think the Warriors will be fine. I think the Warriors will still end up in the conference finals if everything if everybody gets to the playoffs healthy. I think the Warriors will be fine. I think they're still going to make the playoffs. I don't think they're really worried about their seed because I think when everybody's on the court, they still have the best starting five, and I think their bench will come around. You know what I'm saying? I think they'll still get one more person who can consistently play beside Poole, uh, whether that's Anthony Lamb, whether that's Dante DiVincenzo, whether that's Kuminga. I think they're also going to get somebody else who consistently produces off that bench throughout the season. And I think that's going to help them tremendously getting closer to the end of the season. But I think we're just seeing hungrier teams. The 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 Fox and Sabonis, they're ready to prove themselves. Obviously, the, the Kings haven't done anything in 20 years. That, and I watched a video on the Kings yesterday about how – how their offense is one of the most efficient in the NBA. I mean, Mike Brown is really turning around that entire organization, and we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes. I mean, the Jazz, who expected them to be anything? We're just seeing the hungrier teams rise to the top. But I don't think it will last, though. You know what I'm saying? A couple of teams, I think, will stay up here. I think the, the Pelicans, obviously, the Grizzlies, obviously, will stay up here. I think the Trailblazers, I think, will tail off. I think the Kings yeah. could potentially stay in there. But I think the Jazz tell off, and I think you see the Mavericks, the, Nuggets, the Warriors get back in. The Nuggets are a tricky team because they can push teams to the limit, but they can also tell off if it just doesn't go their way. So I, I definitely understand that point. So. And the thing about the Nuggets, I think the Nuggets are, are in that group where I put hungry teams because I think they still want to prove themselves. Even though we've yeah. seen them get to the Western Conference Finals in that bubble season, people still question if Jokic can be the best player on a championship team because when is the last time we've seen a team, especially in this generation since 2010, with a dominant big man win a championship? I mean, you have to be a dominant wing or you have to be a dominant guard to win championships in this NBA. Can Jokic be your best player on a championship team? I think they want to prove that he can be. Or uh, Jamal Murray can be one of the best players on a championship. I think they're ready to prove that. So I think I throw them in that conversation of hungry teams ready to prove themselves. 
And I, well, we talked about kind of the same oh, thing with the 76ers. Like, because mm-hmm. if you're going to bring that up for Jokic, we got to say the same shit with Joel Yeah, Embiid, for sure. Who, no, who for we sure. We were just talking about having yeah. damn near an MVP season. Can Joel Embiid be your best player on a championship team? For sure. I think, I think Joel, and you see the talent difference with Embiid and Jokic. Jokic can win MVPs, and Jokic can even, you know, be a force when it comes to playoff time. But can he really be the catalyst, like, really sets your tone higher than it's ever been to get you the chip? That I don't know. I I feel more confident saying that about Joel Embiid than I Me would Jokic. Me too. I, say, I feel confident more about that saying Embiid too. Yeah. Defensively, even though statistically, Jokic is one of the better defenders in the NBA. I still get more of a defensive presence from Joel B. when you talk about this, the explosiveness and the athleticism uh-huh. aspect. You know what I'm saying? They can move his feet better than uh than Jokic can as well. I get more of a presence that he can be the one that can win a championship. But I think we've seen it in that bubble run where if Jamal Murray can get back to that level where he was dropping 35, 40 a game, it felt like in that bubble run, if he can get back to that level, then we can start having that conversation of like, oh damn, the Nuggets can do something. Because I think it's it's just like with uh with Giannis and like Middleton. A lot of people questioned if Giannis could be the best player on a championship team uh, a couple of years ago. But people kept saying like Middleton can be the best player during like the closing moments and throughout games. Yeah. He can be the one you give. He can get the buckets while throughout the game Giannis gets his thing going. I think it could be the same thing for the Nuggets where Jokic can still be your best guy. But down the stretch, you know where the ball is going. You know it's going to Jamal Murray. I think that has to be the formula for the Nuggets if they want to win championships. I think you either have to have a dominant wing or you have to have a dominant guard because that's all we've seen over the past, what, 12 years. When has the last center been the best player? Like Shaq, nigga? Like Tim Duncan? Like the fuck? Like, think about the Miami Heat, for example. We know Bam Adebayo is the most talented player as far as potential, as far as right now, however you want to slice it. Bam Adebayo is the best player on the Miami Heat right now. Can we count on Bam being the main piece for us to get a chip? No. It has to be somebody like a Donovan Mitchell coming. You know, obviously he's in Cleveland now, but I'm just speaking back Mm -hmm. to when we were talking about that you know it will take a donovan mitchell coming it will take a Kawhi of or maybe even, even jimmy, a brandon jimmy. ingram like but i'm saying like, like even that. from what we've seen in this playoffs jimmy was that dominant wing who was making all of the players necessary during yeah. the run to the eastern conference fight like you have to have a dominant wing bro you just can't have a big man you just giving him the ball and you making him making everything work around him like that shit cool in the regular season but niggas lock on to that in the playoffs, dog, and that shit gets easier to guard. Every time they play the Warriors, it's a sweep or they losing in five games because the Warriors just throw Draymond on Jokic and y'all can't stop us on offense. That shit yeah. look like easy work. <laughs> that shit look like easy work. And that's the thing with the Nuggets that I'm afraid of. Y'all going to keep going into that roadblock until something changes, bro, where y'all have to change the dynamic of this team. Y'all changed it in the bubble run, but y'all got to keep that formula the same where Jamal Murray has to be your guy come playoff time. And moving on to why is no one talking about the Nets? I know the Nets had one a hell of a month, bro. Because obviously they had that whole Kyrie situation just went down. <laughs> and then KD was talking shit by his teammates like a, a few weeks ago. But the Nets are quietly winning games, bro. Quietly winning games. They started off the season terrible. Did they start off the season yep. like 8 and 11 or, or some trash? Yeah, shit? It was trash. It, it was bad. It was, they was like lower than the 10th seed, I think, when they started. They were off. lower than the 12th. Yeah, they were low, low. They were like down there with the heat. And now we see mm-hmm. them at fourth in the, the Eastern Conference, and they're only uh, a half of game out of third. <laughs> so obviously the talent we're starting to see come together right now. Everybody's healthy. Kyrie has come back from suspension. KD is playing at a high level. Kyrie is playing at a high level. Ben Simmons is doing Ben Simmons things, and it's working for this team now. And everybody else is healthy when you talk about Seth Curry, Joe Harris, Nick Claxton, and all those type of players. Like, can we start to throw the Nets in that conversation of, like, have they redeemed themselves? Let me put it that way. Have they redeemed themselves to be put up in the conversation with the Nets, the Celtics, or with the Celtics and the Bucks and the Cavs? I would say 
with the Cavs, yeah, because the Cavs ain't proved nothing yet. As excited yeah, sure. as we are to watch them and as exciting as their future is, they haven't proved anything yet. So I'll put them with the Cavs, of course. But the Celtics and the Bucks, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. I will go ahead and give props to um Ben Simmons. I trash Ben Simmons a lot, just like a lot of other people. But Ben Simmons been doing his part. But he's been doing his part because of what I said needs to happen with Ben Simmons for the last year and a half now, bro. Put him on a team where he's like the third best player, where he's not really yeah. looked at at all to save the day. Just be that great defensive player that you are and give me at least, you know, 12 to 15 points. Like, if you can do that, I think Ben Simmons can be fine. He just isn't the player that a lot of us thought he would be to where he's and, leading the and team. And that's the to thing, he's getting bro. 25 to 30 points and that's tonight. The thing. And like, yeah. No, he's not that. He's a great role player. Hell of a, a hell of a um hell of a ruse that he pulled of making us think he was something else. But he's really a great role player, and I I gotta give him credit for that. I know we trash him a lot, but I'll I'll eat some humble he pie and give him credit for that. It's Draymond 2.0. He's a more athletic Draymond, bro. That's really what he is. You know what I'm saying? And that's something that we have to accept. And I agree with you on the expectation point of we expected him to be like a star in this league. And we've seen uh, Draymond go to All Star, so Ben Simmons can still have those All Star. Yeah, he can still make an All Star. But appearance. we thought he was going to be like one of the best players in the league. People was calling him and the next Bron, bro. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Bron. They thought he was going to take over the league. Even I thought he was going to take over the league at one point. And now I wish just like, okay, I know what he is now, and I know not to expect more than what I what he is at this point. Even though I still want that nigga to shoot sometimes. I know who he is. You know what I'm saying? I know who he is at this point. And that's and that's good for this team because you got shooters all around. You got you really don't have a center that's clogging the paint. Claxton is somebody who floats. He doesn't dominate the ball. You can get the ball to your playmakers and Kyrie, the KD, Joe Harris, Seth Curry. You got so many playmakers that he doesn't have to worry about scoring. Any just focus on the defensive end, bro, and make hustle plays. And it's working for this team. They're 17 and 12, and they're up there, top four in the Eastern Conference. And I have to give Jock Vaughn a whole lot of credit because this this damn, this whole team, even just a couple of weeks ago with that Kyrie situation, was looking dysfunctional as shit. And it looked like it was going to really tear apart pretty fast. But I feel like Jock Vaughn has really consolidated, not really consolidated, but has brought this team together and has made them what they are. So I have to give him a lot of credit. And he should be up there in that coach of the year conversation just for putting this dysfunctional shit and making yep. it functional. <laughs> like, that's something that a lot of these head coaches don't get uh, credit for when they have to, like, manage egos and shit like that. But with this crazy-ass situation, what we see... With... Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but with this crazy-ass situation that we've been seeing with the Nets to start the season with the coach being fired, with the Kyrie situation, with KD requesting the trade before the season, that's a lot to put on a new head coach in Jock Vaughn. With the Ime Udoka rumors of yeah, hey, with Ime, the Udoka Ime Udoka might Udoka be his own new coach. So. Exactly. And him to be leading this team, they're on a four-game winning streak. Like, I agree with Egan on the point of that. I would not put them boys up there with the, the Celtics and the, and the Bucks. I think that's a easy, easy two-man race in the East. But I just want to give them credit because they're making it work. They started off the season terrible, bro. Yeah. And moving on. Last NBA topic is Cade Cunningham is out for the season with a shin injury. He'll be getting surgery on that. He's been out for the last three, four weeks with that injury. But my takeaway from this is tanking for Wimby. If you guys do not know, I am a resident <laughs> Detroit fan. Detroit is my second favorite team. I said it after Cade was drafted, and we are tanking for Wimby. <laughs> I wanted the heat to take from Wimby, but it looks like Detroit beat us to it. <laughs> and I really think, I really think that they're going to get Wimby, bro. They just had the fifth pick. They should have had a top three pick this year. I think the NBA will reward them, and we could potentially see a trio of the future of Kay Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and Victor Wimbenyama, bro. That's a, that's a high, that's a that's a that's a nice ass trio, bro. That's a nice ass trio. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm making sure the Pistons can really lock in that pick. Yep, between them and the Rockets, that's all is between. And you know it got that lottery, that whole lottery situation. So them damn balls. Oh yeah, so, anyway. so so it's really like a hey out of these. You really teams, don't know. Yeah, you can tank yeah, and you, you don't still know. don't know if you're gonna get the pick. Yeah. But but I like that though. I like that. I like that. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we got to think if the ooh, I ain't gonna lie, I might want the Hornets to tank. Ooh, I might want the Hornets, the Hornets. to tank. Oh no! <laughs> Give my boy yeah. Melo Whippy. You, you want you Mello want you want me? you want Michael That's Jordan. It. To have somebody like Victor Wimbanyama <laughs> on his hell, hey, 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 yeah, I do you're not want that far ahead. You're thinking too far ahead. <laughs> nah, I do. You want <laughs> Michael Jordan to just, have just somebody think like surface Victor level? Wim- nah, no. just, just think surface level. Just think surface <laughs> level. Mellow and Wimby. Just think about that. Don't think about uh, anything. Ah, <laughs> okay, okay. Don't think about all the important stuff. You're thinking about all the important stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, that that shit would be nice too. And they really don't have a center either. That's something. That's a position of need too. For that's what I'm saying. See, so you worried about the need. important stuff like managing. And all <laughs> that. We'll worry about that when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's crazy, man. But damn, uh, prayers up to K though, man. He was having a terrific season before he got hurt. Hopefully, he comes back from the shin injury. He gets back to doing what he does, man. So definitely prayers to him. But hopefully, they do get Wimby though, man. That would be an exciting trio. And moving on to Two Wild Wednesday. I got Brock Purdy will be the Niners quarterback in 2023. Too wild or not too wild? I say not too wild. Even if he doesn't start the season off as the starter, if they choose to go with Trey Lance, I think Brock Purdy can possibly win that quarterback battle if there even needs to be a battle, depending on how Mm. Trey Lance does over the offseason. So if there's any doubt in who the starter will be, I think Brock Purdy going to win it. They have to come out and full be all behind Trey Lance for me to say too wild, but I'll say not too wild right now. Ah, I see what you're doing. I would say too wild because I think Tom Brady is coming to town. I think Brock Purdy will be on the team, but I think that that Tom Brady thing, I think it's home. I already think he already has a connection with Shanahan, and I think he's going to end up transporting over to San Francisco. I think Brock Purdy will be on the team. So if Brady gets hurt, or maybe when Brady leaves after a season, Brock Purdy can be the quarterback after Brady. But in 2023, I think it's Brady's job. Moving on. The Dolphins are missing the playoffs. Too wild or not too wild? Uh, Let's look at the Dolphins' schedule, bro. Because we that. already talked about the Dolphins playing the... Who the Dolphins play this week? The, the Dolphins play the Bills this week. Dolphins play the Bills this week. They got the Packers after that. They got the Patriots after that. And they got the Jets. Patriots, scrappy team. Jets, they just went to the wire with the Jets. The Jets beat the Dolphins earlier in the season, too. So you got oh, the yeah. Dolphins? The, the, the Dolphins making the playoffs, yeah. They Dolphins making the playoffs? Yeah. Not you got too, the Bills? Too wild. Yeah. Yeah, they, the they're Dolphins. definitely make, they're definitely making the playoffs. That's definitely too, that's definitely too wild. Uh, I had looked at their record. I'm like, they already a, a game ahead. They really just got to not suck the last four games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're basically – because I think they're winning two of these games. They're they're beating the Patriots. That's the what I'm Patriots. saying. Like, they're, they're winning – And they're beating the Packers. Yeah, they're before. beating two of these games. The Bills is going to be a tough one. I think the Jets going to be a tough one. Could be for playoff positioning, but I think they're winning. Uh, yeah, I think they get to the playoffs. So, not too wild. I really don't have too many for two wild Wednesday. So, we're I got moving a question, on. Though. Okay. I got a question though. It, it's not really a two wild Wednesday question, but where do you think Jimmy Garoppolo will go from here? He's he's out for the rest of the season for the 49ers with an injury. We know at this point, as talented as Jimmy Garoppolo has shown us to be, as many games as he's mm. shown us he can win and how productive he can be with the right system, he cannot stay healthy. Can Jimmy Garoppolo get a starting job somewhere else? Or are we witnessing the end of his quote unquote prime of his career at this point? That's a tough one, bro. I still think there's an opportunity for him to get that Patriots job, bro. I think Bill would welcome him back with open arms. And I don't think Mac Jones has been playing that great this season. I think Jimmy G, if he wants to start off as a backup, I think he can overtake that job. But we just talked about it earlier of everybody has their quarterback. You know what I'm saying? And Jimmy G isn't that guy to overcome and beat somebody who's established in a, a certain team situation. You know what I'm saying? So I don't see him really going anywhere. Oh, he can damn get starter. that Colts job. He can get that Colts oh, job. Oh, he can go to the Colts. Damn, he can go to the Colts. Ooh. Damn. Jimmy G to the Saints? 
I think the Saints drive somebody this year. True. They, they four, they're four and nine, so they're going to have a low enough draft. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Damn, that would have been nice. That would have been nice. I ain't even going to lie Jimmy to G to the Colts. I can definitely see Jimmy G to the Colts, though. Jimmy G to the Colts. Colts to the Saints. But, they're my two predict um, predictable teams for Jimmy G. But his days in San Francisco are definitely over. <laughs> even though he was having one hell of a season this year. You know what I'm saying? And I still think they have the best possible chance to win with Jimmy G this year. I think the injury track record is starting to pile up on Jimmy G. It feels like every year Jimmy G is starting to get hurt now. Even though he's a winner and he's won with San Francisco, I just think his time is running out. But uh, anything else? Uh, Nah, I ain't got no more. All right, moving on to social media wants to know. We got is stand-up comedy dying? Yeah, so I thought of this because I saw a clip of Drewski on The Breakfast Club. Yeah, I'm going to play the clip. Yeah, um, y'all going to hear him about his first time meeting Kevin Hart. Quincy going to play it. The first thing Kevin Hart told me when I, I, I went to his show and I went backstage and I was like, I was just watching him, you know, everybody congratulating him. Like, oh, my God, it was a great show. Oh, my God. And I was just looking at him from across the room because they invited me to the green room. And I'm just like, all right, when's my moment to say what's up? You know, like I was kind of nervous, you know. And um, I'm expecting just to be like, yo, you did, a, you had a great show. Dude breezes past me and he looks at me and says, stop being a bitch. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about, man? <laughs> and I, I, I had my, like, I had my like, hand extended out. Like, for, hey, what's up, man? I thought he was going to be like, hey, you're killing this shit, man. He walked past me again. He said, I'm telling you, stop being a bitch. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm asking this boy, you know, what, yo, what is Kevin talking about, for real? I, and, yeah, and, he, and he walked up to me. Get on that stage. And, and he, and yeah, he, he said, get on that stage. He said, stop acting like you're too good to do stand-up. And he was like, you're doing all the little hosts and the tours. He said, but you, you you ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. He said, you, he said, see, y'all scared, man. He said, these new cats, y'all scared. Y'all y'all think y'all got all the fame. Y'all think y'all the shit. He said, stop being a bitch. I'm like, man. And that, that hit my soul, man. Yeah, so a lot. it was a lot of mixed reviews on it. I, I took it as a cool thing, like a real OG thing, because Kevin Hart has shown before that he he likes Drewski. Like, he he supports Drewski. So this wasn't a, a lot of people was talking about, I ain't letting no grown man call me no bitch, blah, blah, blah. Kevin Hart clearly was doing it in a motivational way because they clearly are cool with each other. But I brought up the question, is stand-up comedy dying off? Because we see it become less and less popular now as the years have gone with social media comedians and social media entertainers being more popular is that really going to be a requirement now for us to call people comedians i think so like let me just get my mm. opinion off now i i don't think you can be considered a real comedian if you cannot do improv if you cannot stand up and do jokes and make people laugh like the the basic form of comedy if you cannot do that can I really call you a comedian for real? You may be an entertainer, but are you a comedian? Same thing with rappers. We say all the time, like, you ain't got to write every damn thing. But if we find out you just don't write nothing or, like, you can't freestyle, like, that was a big thing with rap. Like, people say, yeah, you can write songs, but don't forget what the foundation of this shit was. Like, niggas being able to rap and rhyme. I heard Snoop Dogg on the 85 South Show interview the other day it was like, no disrespect to battle rap today, but we don't consider what y'all do battle rap now. Back when we was coming up, you had to come off the dome with that shit. Like, if you couldn't come off the dome and you went home and wrote some shit, we weren't respecting that shit. That's just what it was. So I think Kevin Hart did it from a big bro standpoint, but a lot of people mm -hmm. took it as he hating on the young niggas, and I just don't see it as that. I think it's a... I don't know. I think it's just a changing of... um of social media and the time, bro. You don't have to be a stand-up comedian to be a comedian. I think you can do what Drew Street has done and go in that social media direction and still be called a, a, a comedian now. And I think that he's he was trying to have Drew Ski more so expand his horizons to like, this is what you can be. This is what your fullest potential can be. But a lot of people are seeing how fruitful this social media comedian role is, making skits, doing the funny shit, making funny videos. That's fruitful. And you don't have to step mm -hmm. out in front of a crowd. You can do that all from the, the comfort of your crib. That's comfortable for a lot of people. He was more so trying to push Drewski, I feel like, out of his comfort zone of like, 
stop being a bitch and go ahead and do this. Like, this is what your fullest potential is. Let me push you out of your comfort zone to do this. You know what I'm saying? That's more so how I felt from watching the video. I don't think he was calling him a bitch to like, you know what I'm saying? Make him do something that he didn't want yeah. to do. More so yeah. just push him out of his comfort zone of like, yeah, what you're doing now is good. It's great. Obviously, like you said, he's a fan of Drewski, but I see you in this lane. You can also be good in this lane. But that's something I also wanted to talk about of like, with social media, you hear all the time, like for Summer, Summer Walker, for example, she has social anxiety. Like a lot of people don't want to step out in front of a crowd and try to make them laugh or anything like that, especially when, or sing or do any form of entertainment. When you can do that from the comfort of your home or go to a studio where you're by yourself or you're with somebody else, when you can do it from the comfort of your home. And that's the benefit of social media, but it's also like a curse as well because it makes you more uh, to yourself and more hold in. But you can you see how fruitful it is, though, how I don't have to leave my house and I can still be considered a comedian. I can still make this amount of money from Instagram, from TikTok and from YouTube. Like, I think we're, I think we're just seeing the benefits of that right now. And we see that Drewski made his name off this Twitter and Instagram shit. So he wouldn't even have these type of opportunities if it wasn't for this social media shit anyway. He wouldn't even have the opportunity to do stand up if it wasn't for the skits that he was doing on social media first. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily true that you have to do this stand-up shit to be considered a comedian. I think you can do what Drewski's done and what a lot of people have been doing of like, yeah, make these skits, make these videos, make these TikToks, and you're still funny. You're still an entertainer in a lot of people's minds because what are people on 90% of the time? They're on their phones. So we're seeing yep. you more than anybody. I'm seeing you more than a stand-up comedian because who wants to leave their house to go watch some comedy shit when we got all these comedy specials on Netflix and Amazon Prime? Now, it's like, shit, I can watch that shit anytime. I ain't going to go watch this nigga do stand-up. But what we going to watch? We going to watch your skit, you know what I'm saying, with Supreme Dreams, Drewski, all them type of niggas. So I think that's more fruitful. You know what I'm saying? I think he was just trying to push him out of his lane, but I think social media shit is more fruitful. I, I totally agree. It's more fruitful. And there's a lot more benefits benefits to it now than just doing stand up back in the day. Um, but I, I agree. I think it's just a we're in a different time now, bro. Excuse me. And it, it, it's just different. Like things are just different. I don't think Drewski hasn't done stand up yet because he doesn't want to. He just hasn't done it because the opportunity. Why? He just yeah, he just never thought of the opportunity being of a use at this point because mm -hmm. it's like i've already kind of made it to the level to where everybody knows who i am i make everybody laugh so how much higher can i go but i think that exactly. was kevin's point of like exactly bro, you think you at where you want to be right now do this stand-up shit bro i promise and kevin probably telling him that because he probably feel you can do this shit like mm -hmm. you probably can get into this lane a comedian that i love bro that is very like under the radar but he started off like a lot with a lot of this social media shit ryan davis for those of y'all who don't know ryan mm -hmm. davis he's a comedian if you look him up on instagram he does stand-up shows all the time he does comedy tour and imp improv shows at little places and whatnot but he also gives clips on instagram where he talks about um a lot of the current shit that's going on but he does it in a joking manner like he he reminds me of Dave Chappelle, bro. Like if you start watching Ryan Davis stuff, you're gonna be like, damn, he really got that Dave Chappelle vibe to him because he keeps shit real, but he finds ways to make it funny at the same time. But him, Ali Sadiq, uh, it's a couple of other people that I can think of right now because I I love stand up comedy. Like I'll watch mm -hmm. clips and videos all the time to stand up comics, or whether I know these people or not, because I just think it's. I don't know. Maybe it's just that traditional side of me that loves that shit of like, damn, you really know the craft for real. Like you really know what you're doing back to that battle rap shit. I love watching battle rap now, but I probably would get more excited if I watched like some nineties battle rap, like the story we always hear of how Busta Rhymes and Jay-Z went to the same high school and they went, they went battle raps all the time. Like that shit was probably fire to see people come up with fire shit on the spot. I know it's cool to, you know, have dates set for, like, the URL and, like, you hear some of the hardest bars of the year or whatever, but that shit people go home, write down, rehearse, practice, and all that. Like, it's not mm -hmm. really off of the dome. And I think with stand-up comedy, I feel like it's that same form of can you really be funny on the spot? Can you really make people be intrigued with what you're saying and laugh at what you're saying for an hour plus? 
not some shit that you record and edit and all that and get the funniest shit of what you've done. Can you do it in front of people on the spot? And I think that's all Kev was trying to like get him to branch out to. And and also everybody isn't meant for that stand up life, bro. Because everybody learns, especially when you first start doing that stand up shit. Boy, it's an adjustment period that a lot of people aren't built for. When you gotta yeah. go to the laugh house and really gotta get your, you know, what I'm saying you get your jokes. Off. You know what I'm saying? You get you try to get some jokes off. You think some jokes you hit. You think you know what I'm saying? You got some bangers in you, and niggas ain't laughing. That's a rude awakening that a lot of people aren't ready for. And I don't think if Drewski doesn't have to go through that, why? Why would I put myself through that when I'm living in this box right here where I'm living? You know, I'm meeting Drake. I'm with I'm hanging with Drake and OBJ and all these type of niggas. And I ain't touched the stand up mic. So what I got to do all this extra shit for? I'm doing all this type of marketing with Sprite. What I got to do all this extra shit for? Why I got to do stand up and put myself out there? If right. he wants to challenge himself, that's a, that's a cool way that can be his excuse. But a lot of people aren't built for the criticism that comes with or the harsh reality that comes with uh, stand up comedy, bro. It's a tough life, bro. And a lot of stand up comedians will tell you like the beginning, man, it's a yeah. long road to that's get to rough, where a lot bro. of these people are, bro. It's a long road. Carlos Miller, another underrated stand-up comedian, bro. I know we've known Carlos Miller for like wilding out for like the last five to six years up until now. But I, I've seen like some of his old stand-up shit when he first started. Nigga been funny, bro. Carlos Miller been funny. It's mm -hmm. just in the middle of him really trying to break off with so not social media, but with his comedy career, social media launched. Like, and it was like, oh shit. Not only am I doing stand up now, but I can start telling jokes online and it just kind mm -hmm. of catapulted him, you know, to a space to where people may consider him a social media comedian. But he started before it, it's just it hit him right in the middle of him doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> moving on to the next topic, I got is real question, bro. I was thinking about this shit earlier today, bro. Name three Thanksgiving films, dog. Like right now, name the three Thanksgiving films. Three Thanksgiving films. Uh is uh what's that one movie? Martin Lawrence. Is Ross Welcome Home Roscoe Jenkins? Is that a thing? That was in the movie? summertime. Nope, that was in the summertime. That was, that a was in the summertime? What the fuck? That was a cookout. That was for his like family anniversary or some shit. It's not a Thanksgiving movie. I thought it was around Thanksgiving though. Is that a Thanksgiving movie, I don't bro? Know. I don't know, nah, nah, now that you think about it. Because nah. <laughs> this, this is what I, this is, but this is the point I wanted to make with this shit, bro. Because obviously, when we think about Christmas movies, it's like, man, you think about Christmas movies, everything pops in your head. You talk about, you think about the elf movies, Nightmare Before Christmas, you think about all these movies, Holy Santa Claus, Fred. all these, you know what I'm saying? You think about Charlie Brown, you think about all of this shit that you've seen throughout your life. But when you think about Thanksgiving films, like, nigga, Eddie, you, bro, you really, hey, you really gotta think about that shit of like, What's the thing? What what makes a Thanksgiving film? Did it have to come out on, like around Thanksgiving, or did it have to be about Thanksgiving? Like in the movie, we were doing. Oh, it got to be shit. about Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay, so if that's the criteria, yeah. nigga, name me three. Oh, I can't. I, I, I <laughs> thought that Welcome Home is... Roscoe Jenkins was one. It's clearly not. So. <laughs> and that's my point because I, I will always remember this during middle school, bro. We used to always watch Matilda during Thanksgiving time. And I don't even know if Matilda was a Thanksgiving movie. But it's like, <laughs> it's not a Thanksgiving movie, but we used to watch that shit at Thanksgiving. So every time I think about Thanksgiving films, I think about Matilda. What the I fuck is a Thanksgiving it, movie, bro? Then I thought about Soul Food. Is Soul Food a Thanksgiving movie? Soul That's Food with, uh, was it? it wasn't Jada Pinkett. Damn, who was it? Who was in Soul Food, bro? It was Nia Long. It was Loretta Devine. It was uh, it was my girl Vivica Fox. Is that a is that a oh Thanksgiving you got a, a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving? I forgot they definitely had a Thanksgiving special. Um, this nigga gotta look him up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, bro, this shit tough for Thanksgiving. I can't think of any, bro. I can't think of it's, any. It's this white movie called Home for the Holidays. Never heard of it. With Robert Downey, you feel Jr. what I'm saying? Because you know, uh, you know, for things, uh, not Thanksgiving, but for Christmas time, like people, instead of watching the basketball games, they watching like a Christmas movie or some shit like that. If you yeah. wanted to watch a Thanksgiving movie over Thanksgiving when everybody at the crib, you really have no options. <laughs> you 
you really have no options at all. It's like you gotta watch football on Thanksgiving. You have no options to watch a, a Thanksgiving movie. Yeah, there. I don't see any real Thanksgiving <laughs> movies like that. That's a good point. Never thought of that shit, bro. There's Is that movies shit not that crazy, people though? are putting. There's there's movies that people are putting that give you a holiday season feel, exactly, but they're but not, it's not Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving movies. Like that's because you a, when you think about Thanksgiving, oh, go ahead. A, a Christmas movie that people be forgetting is a Christmas movie. Gremlins. Gremlins is a whole. Gremlins Christmas is definitely movie, a Christmas bro. Movie. For sure, like, for I sure even, I forgot. I totally forgot about that shit until I thought about it. I was like, "Damn, that whole movie was centered around Christmas, which is wild." <laughs> which is, oh my! But that's crazy, though. How that's such an untapped, you know what I'm saying? Movie niche. You feel what I'm saying? When to just talk about Thanksgiving movies, because when you think about Thanksgiving, what you think about Pilgrims, Indians, all that type of shit. We have no type of movies like that. They maybe made a Pilgrim movies, but niggas not watching it. But is anybody even really? enthusiastic about making a thanksgiving movie now because of you know over the last 20 years or so all the the change in opinion of what we think about thanksgiving now like Mm. a lot of us don't even say happy thanksgiving to each other anymore because we're we're in such a woke culture now that we understand the background of thanksgiving yeah with christmas it's more so religion type stuff not necessarily Mm. what has been done to you know, these people are these people or whatever. So people are more affluent to Christmas because it's like, hey, there's no, there's no like easy to point at negative connotation with it. With Thanksgiving, we know the history behind it. So people aren't really eager to celebrate the shit already. Mm-hmm. We're just eating because we're off work at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. So I don't know if people are really in a push or in a rush to like really make a Thanksgiving movie if that ain't even really what we fucking with for real. So, damn, that's a good ass point, bro. But still, even before this woke culture, you would still think we would have gotten a yeah, couple we, of we Thanksgiving of classics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We should have still gotten a, a couple of classics. Even just take away these last twenty years, we should have had something where it's like that's a Thanksgiving movie. It's like damn, when I think about Thanksgiving, I think about that film. Nothing else, bro. Like I said, I think about Matilda, and Matilda is not a fucking Thanksgiving movie. It outside was just played over Thanksgiving. Outside of that damn Charlie Brown special, you don't see no Thanksgiving stuff. The only stuff no. you get for Thanksgiving, you get like Thanksgiving episodes with shows. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, I think that's the niche for Thanksgiving, bro. And it is, I think they do that because that's how we treat Thanksgiving. We know the biggest holiday of the year is Christmas. Thanksgiving is just that that pre-turn up. So it's like, I think that's how they treat it with shows and movies. We're like, hey, we're going to give y'all a bunch of Thanksgiving shows, but the movies, we're going to have the movies for Christmas. And I think that's mm. how they treat it, bro. I, because everybody hates Chris. Thanksgiving episode. Uh, Every Everybody has a Thanksgiving or Christmas. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Uh, who else has a Thanksgiving episode? Like, even a cartoon. Um, shit. It was a... Uh, you talking about Powderpuff few. Girls, Dexter's Lab, like Powerpuff all of these Girls, shows had like, Thanksgiving episodes. There was like, Thanksgiving at, at the same Proud time. Proud Family. I think there was a Thanksgiving yeah. episode for Proud Family. Like so, mm-hmm. that's so Raven. Like there's Thanksgiving episodes. Family Guy, American Dad. Like, but mm-hmm. when it comes to movies, I I really think that's just a Christmas bag. <laughs> that yeah. shit is crazy, boy. <laughs> I want you to ask if you're listening to this, bro. I want you to ask a family member or a friend, bro, to name three Thanksgiving movies and look how <laughs> stupid they look when they, they try to think about that shit. Because I swear I was thinking about that shit earlier of like, damn, what the fuck? I, I really didn't know. I really couldn't think of any. By definition, that's what I think of. Like, when I think of when you say Christmas movie, I think of a movie that is about Christmas. I don't think about a oh, movie sure. that comes out for like Avatar that's coming out this weekend. Oh, that's yeah. not a Christmas movie. Just because it's mm-hmm. coming out during Christmas time, that don't make it a Christmas movie. If the movie is about Christmas, that's what makes it a Christmas movie. Like people try to say Friday after next ain't a Christmas movie. The whole movie that's, is about a cracking Santa Claus. That. I it's see a, you tweet that, bro. People gotta stop tripping on that. It's definitely a Christmas movie. The whole movie is literally about their Christmas presents. Being it was a black Santa stealing Santa. gifts. Like, <laughs> how, how much more Christmas can you get? Like, I, I don't they had a Christmas like, party. <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, what are we talking about, bro? There was oh, a literal man, Christmas tree in the movie. Like, <laughs> I don't know how much more Christmas you can get. Yeah, that's easily a Christmas movie. Niggas just hating for no reason. <laughs> All right, moving on to entertainment and current events. 
We got Brittany Griner is free finally after what six months? Has it been six months? Uh, it's been eight, February. I think it's been eight months. Eight months. Eight months. Yeah. It's been February. I thought February ten months. Because they said she was in there since February, but people didn't start finding out till like March. Damn. Yeah. So she it's been about so ten months. Nine. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Like we nine, just gonna ten. say damn near yeah. Yeah, damn, damn near, near yeah. Because <laughs> I was the last thing I heard about Brittany Griner before she was free is that she was like in a Russian camp. She had cut her mm-hmm. hair off. She was about to like basically start slaving and start to mine. Like, I don't yep. know if y'all watch Stranger Things when y'all seen like David Harbour's character where he was like mining damn metal and all that shit in the concentration camp. I was basically hearing that Brittany Griner was doing that same type of thing. Get yeah, that same type of treatment too. Like she was a dude. Yeah. So if y'all haven't heard, um, which I'm sure most of y'all have based off social media, Brittany Griner, the um the famous WNBA star who's been captive in Russia for damn near a year at this point, she was finally set free. Uh, I guess thanks to Joe Biden and the Biden administration, they finally pulled off a trade with Russia. However, <laughs> <laughs> one of the many complaints that we've seen from this is who we traded Brittany Griner for. A lot of people were saying this is worse than the Rudy Gobert trade. Like it was a lot of people <laughs> worse talking. Than the, hey, worse than the Russell Wilson joint. <laughs> <laughs> so we traded Brittany Griner. Uh, I mean, we traded Victor Bout. For Brittany Griner. And Victor Bout is a Russian arms dealer. He's a weapons manufacturer and former Soviet military translator. And he used multiple he used his multiple companies to smuggle arms from Eastern Europe to Africa and the Middle East during the 90s and the early 2000s. I think one of his nicknames is like they call him the most dangerous man on the planet. Of uh, the a man of the man of war, like he's been called so many nicknames to where a lot of people in America were like, This is who we gave up. I mean, granted, yes, we're happy Britney Griner is back, but damn, we gave away one of the most dangerous people on earth who is Russian, and we got beef with Russia right now. So it was it was a wild conversation on Twitter. And th- but this was the thing about the whole social media uproar. Because when we were hearing the first rumblings about a trade happening, he was the person that they were talking about trading from the jump. So I already knew who dude was a few months ago when they were talking about trading Brittany Grider for him. I was surprised nobody else did. But when they were talking about trading people, they definitely said Victor Bout was going to be the person that they traded for Brittany Griner. I didn't know to the extent, but I knew that he murdered some people and shit like that. I didn't know he was like on a rampage, like an arms dealer and all that type of shit. But I knew he'd done some grimy shit. So I knew they were going to trade like a significant player for him. But to this degree, it's crazy. But my point is, we can't act like we just found this shit out, bro. Because it's been in the news for a minute that this was the trade and the swap that was going to happen. Obviously, when it was official, everybody starts to get in an uproar about it. But it's been talked about for months now. Like, this was the trade that was going to happen. You could call it unfair and lopsided because it is for sure. A a WNBA player for uh, obviously a a armed murderer, arms dealer uh, called the what what did you say earlier? What is his nickname? Something of death. Uh, The man of war or some shit. Yeah, the man of war, the swordsman of death. I heard I heard so many names about this dude. So it looks unfair. The most dangerous man on the planet. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I really heard. Most dangerous man on the planet because he can get to so many countries and being an arms dealer and shit like that. But what have y'all been screaming for the last five months? And what have we been screaming? Free We've Brittany been screaming, Griner. get free Britney Griner. Her ass free? Y'all ass can't complain now. Nah, it's too late. And, and that's why, that's <laughs> why I don't care about the people complaining <laughs> and shit on social media. People talking about, we in trouble now. Blah, blah, blah. Y'all don't even know these people. Y'all don't even care. <laughs> like, before this trade happened, y'all was not sitting there saying, no, don't trade Victor. Don't trade Victor. Nobody said anything about this like Quincy said. So the fact that now everybody all of a sudden they're United Nations experts and people. I see people <laughs> on social media talking about y'all just wait in a couple years. We're going to regret this. This is bro. Shut up. Y'all do not even be watching the news like that to know what the hell is going to happen. Y'all going to forget all about this in the next week. And y'all going to go back to doing whatever y'all was doing. Everybody's no so upset about it right now. Like me and Quincy say fake mad. We got to get shirts made with fake mad on it. Cause we said that shit. That's like, definitely our but, shit. That's definitely our shit. <laughs> but, uh, I'm just happy she home, bro. Because if this was anybody else's sister, niece, cousin, or whatever, y'all wouldn't give a damn who you had to trade with. Like, you would just make the shit happen. And we've been asking for her to come home this whole time. So, 
if it was a situation where let's say we could have done it, like we could have made the trade, but Joe Biden said, no, we're not giving you Victor. People would have been in an uproar, bro. People would have been like, bro, how you not going to try and get Britney home? You don't care about black women, blah, blah. That would have been the thing. You know, you know, that you don't care about black women. That shit would have came out quick as hell. No that bull. shit would have came out so quick. So it's it's a you damned if you do, you damned if you don't, and it's just we're damned because we did. So yeah, Joe came through, bro. We was we was questioning that boy for a long time of like, you know, what I'm saying you got to make something happen, bro. You're president, make something happen with the swap. You got to get her back to safety, and he did that. It was like I said, was the trade lopsided for sure? I'm not gonna admit. I'm not gonna say it wasn't lopsided. But we've been screaming free Britney Griner for the past nine months, and I'm glad that she's back with her family and all that type of shit. So I'm glad she cool. I don't no, even like is she gonna play basketball no more? Like is like is that even on her mind? Is she gonna become like an activist now? Like you can't go back to playing basketball after you've been in Russia in a slave camp for a couple of months, bro. Like you're not the same person anymore. You know what I'm saying? Because we were hearing in reports that. Like she was starting to like, she was sounding less confident about being free. Like she's not the same Brittany Griner that was in yeah. the USA 10 months ago. Like this is somebody completely different. She probably don't she, even give a fuck about basketball. Think, she didn't even think she was getting out, which, exactly. which she said led, led to her cutting her hair because when it gets like freezing in Russia, she didn't want to get her hair wet and stuff because her hair was going to freeze and this, that, and the third uh, based off of what she anyway. So she had in her mind, like, I'm just not getting out this bitch. So I agree mm-hmm. with Quincy. Like, how how do you go back to playing ball? Because we see when Maya Moore, Maya Moore stopped hooping because she was trying to be an activist to the full degree. You know what I'm saying? And it might be the opposite situation, obviously, because Maya Moore was helping free people as opposed mm-hmm. to Brittany Griner getting free. But it could be mm-hmm. the same thing to where she tries to take a huge step in her platform now to be something she didn't think she would be, an activist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you're not the same, bro. When you was that close to, like, not being sure if you were going to come back home, see your girl again, all that type shit, and you was in a slave camp, you was in a concentration camp? Like, that's yeah. nuts, bro. Because when you're used to this USA shit, you're used to this freedom shit, and you start to get that, that taste of that communism and that Soviet Union shit, it's a whole different world, boy. You, hey, we take it this is. shit for granted. We take this shit for granted, but hey, we definitely lucky. But moving forward, somebody else was free. That nigga Gunner is out that jam. Or he ain't out the jam, but he yeah. at least free for now. He free for now. Yeah, man, that boy Gunner. I know y'all been following, you know, the YSL, free YSL train and whatnot. Uh, it says right here uh, from Spade TV. Gunner uh, Gunna entered a negotiated plea known as an Alford plea in which he pled guilty on one charge because it was in his best interest while maintaining his innocence on the same charge. Gunner was sentenced to five years with one served in prison. The other one, the one year sentence was commuted to time served. The four year remaining balance on his sentence has been suspended and will be subject to, spe- to special conditions including 500 hours of community service. So I was telling Quincy before, he's not free free yet, but he's free in terms of like that man ain't locked up at the moment. He's definitely out roaming the streets, not not roaming the streets, but he's definitely out, you know, back with his family, back with his people, back with whatever YSL people who aren't locked up. You know what I'm saying? Well, he probably- Why would you want to affiliate with anybody YSL after you was just in that jam? And this is what I was telling Edgar uh, before this. Because we see that he pleaded guilty to the racketeering charges, but he was free. Mm-hmm. What does that What does that usually mean? I don't know. Edgar brings up this Alfred plea. Maybe that's something I'm not really accustomed to. But usually when you are plead guilty and you're free, that means you did some ratting. I'm not, I'm not mm-hmm. uh, bashing him for it because, hey, you put me in that type of jam, I'm singing like a fucking canary, my nigga. I didn't <laughs> know that nobody. And I'm a part of this shit because we know the charges that Gunner was in jail for. And they were mostly bullshit because he wasn't the one conspiring to kill anybody. He wasn't in deep like somebody like Young Thug was. It was more so yeah. just being affiliated with the group he got wrapped in to the whole Rico situation. So he wasn't really affiliated to that degree. But that means that he did do some type of snitching, I would think. Like I said, I don't know the details of the Alfred plea, but that would just be what I think. But I, that's all I wanted to say. Like, he, that we have to have that conversation because when y'all was talking about my man, uh, what's my man? Uh, who did that snitching? He caught a rat. 
Six nine. Oh, Takashi six nine. When six nine was doing that, when six nine was doing that ratting, that nigga was called a rat. Had to be put in witness protection. But now nobody's calling gonna rat. Like I said, we don't know the details. We don't know the details. But I'm just wondering, is he gonna get that same type of treatment? But, I don't know. But at the same time, we are, I mean, obviously gonna just got out, so we don't know what he's gonna say yet. But six nine is a totally different situation. Six nine literally came out of prison. It was damn near bragging about the fact that yes, I told on niggas. Yes, I said what I had to say to get out of this shit. And that's and you can't claim to be a street dude. And first off, you already lose street credentials if we found out you snitched. But you going on radio show after radio show just talking about how you snitched. You're going on live just saying, yeah, I did that shit. I, I said this and that. So I get out. You lose all street, quote unquote. You lose all street credibility after that. So we're going to, we can speculate right now that he may have snitched, but we don't know. And I doubt he'll ever say it. Like, I don't I don't hold Gunner to the same standard I hold 6 9 because that I... That man a clown. I'm I'm not gonna hold gunner to that. No, that's real. That's real. That's real. I'm glad he's being posted a lot less, bro. Like I be forgetting that man on social media sometimes. Oh, sure. I'm glad. I'm glad all these outlets not just posting him every damn day no more. That shit was aggravating. Yeah, but definitely, definitely shout out to gunner for getting out that. Like I said, he's not completely out that jam, but for freeing him. Like I said, even if he was to come out and say, or if we find out later down the line that he did snitch. I'm not shaming that nigga at all because a lot of y'all niggas want to act like y'all tough till y'all get put in that jam. And y'all niggas don't know when y'all getting out, especially when a situation where he was just affiliated with the group. He wasn't even in that bitch for real to the same extent as thug. Oh, I'm just in this bitch. I didn't even know I was in. You niggas would do the same shit. You niggas would sing like a canary. So I wouldn't shame it at all. If even if that was the truth, because like I said, I would do the same thing. Like Quincy said, like, he was willing to admit to the racketeering shit. He was probably like, "Yeah, okay, now nah, with the money shit, I was probably fucking up with money. How I probably wasn't supposed to." But all that, all that killing and robbing and all that, I don't know about all that. Nah. I don't know about all that. I was definitely yes, messing sir. with the funds. I was messing with the funds, but all them bodies, yeah, you got to talk to King Slime about all that. <laughs> <laughs> For real, you got to push that shit off to somebody else. Like, yeah, that ain't me, my brother. Hell uh, yeah. Because I was just doing some research on the thug situation on, like, if thug's case was pending or if he could potentially come out anytime soon. And that nigga thug ain't finna come out anytime soon from what I'm seeing. He in there deep. He's in there deep. I mean, mean, I'm hearing 20 plus easy for what he's been doing because I'm hearing conspiring to kill. I'm hearing that he's killed people allegedly. Like I said, nothing has been proven. But this is all of the facts that they have on their side. They have been tracking phone calls. They've talked to certain peoples that have pinned and have pointed out Thug as the person to set up hits and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that's, that's the information. Like that Lucci situation where Lucci almost got killed in prison earlier this mm-hmm. year or like late last year or whatever. That was another thing. I was like, damn. And, and that literally happened like not too long after him and Lucci was beefing. I was like, yeah, they're going to use that for sure. They definitely going to use that. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep, yep. That's a tough one for Thug, but at least Gunner out of there. Like, moving on, we got Fish University starts the first HBCU gymnastics team. Yeah, so it says right here on USA Today, Fisk University, which is located in Nashville, Tennessee, announced in February the formation of its inaugural gymnastics team, making the university the first HBCU to have an intercollegiate women's gymnastic program. Uh, in August, the team enjoyed its first formal practice, which was captured on video by one of the um, gymnasts, and they put it on TikTok, and it went viral. And I want to say in uh, this past fall, they had uh, a couple of their first meets, which they did very well in, and they have like 60 to 70 women on campus like involved trying to you know get onto the gymnastics team and whatnot. So I just wanted to give them a shout-out. I know um, – I know HBCUs have just been a hot topic recently, but shout out to the, it's crazy that we're still doing the first of a lot of stuff, (laughs) but shout out to Fisk University for having the first HBCU gymnast team, because that's a conversation we have all the time, bro. And I I mainly seen girls. I didn't see any boys in it, but just imagine if we started getting boys in gymnastics, bro. I remember growing up seeing black dudes doing flips like crazy (laughs) off the wall in the middle of the yard. 
everything. Like that um that viral video on ESPN on Twitter a couple years ago when that one dude he did like five backflips in a row and he was switching each hand. I was like, bro, how, how are we not in gymnastics? So I hope it bleeds into the HBCU culture to where it's not just women. Like we even start getting dudes involved. If we get dudes involved, they gonna hate us. They go no nah, for sure because we running that shit for sure. We definitely running. We definitely running <laughs> with that shit for sure. All right, and next day we got R. Kelly straight from the cell. He dropped the album. <sighs> I admit it. Yeah, bro. Um, Robert Kelly has dropped an <laughs> album. Apparently, he didn't do it. He's saying he didn't do it, but an album dropped from R. Kelly the uh, these past few days called I Admit It. It was recently taken off all listening platforms, and his lawyer, uh, what's her name? What's her name? Uh, Jennifer Bonjon told the Hollywood Reporter that uh, t- when he was arrested, he had his studio equipment taken and his masters are missing. The music is somewhere out there, but who has it and who has profited off it? We don't know entirely. So R. Kelly came out immediately and said, that's not me. Uh, that's not even my voice for real. Like so. But some of the lyrics was wild as hell. Like the song, the name song, I admit it. He was talking about, yeah, I messed with some underage girls, but what makes that a bad thing? And I'm like, whoa, this mm-hmm. is wild. That, I was like, bro, you're not helping yourself at all. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I was totally taken aback by this. Like, it was definitely disgusting. I, I didn't listen to it. I just heard the little clip that people was talking about. But I don't know. What, what did you think about it? I definitely heard it, bro. And I didn't know if it was true because currently he's going through an appeal situation right now. So it's like, why would R. Kelly at this time? Yes. <laughs> you know, I can I can understand if his appeal got denied. He said, "It's no way I'm getting out this bitch. I'm a drop." <laughs> but why at this moment would he drop this album with the appeal situation going on? Which makes me think that somebody else did drop it. But obviously, that is his voice. So he definitely admitted to this shit. He definitely yeah. admitted to all of the grimy shit that he did. He definitely admitted to fucking with underage girls. You know what I'm saying? So. Obviously, you did say these things, nigga. No matter whether you dropped it or somebody else dropped it, you admitted to what you did. So now the appeals, the appeal is gonna fucking get denied because niggas gonna be like, "Damn, nigga!" In this album, you just said that you were fucking with these girls. That's a close a case closed right here. That's easy yeah. shit. We moving on. So, eh, R. Kelly, we already expected him to stay his rest of the life in jail, and he just solidified it. Yeah, I, I was taken aback by that. I was like, what? Like, you just... It's so just weird, gonna give bro. In? Like, you're just going to give in. The funniest thing like, about it is that it was high key getting listens, too. I yeah, only heard it on the Shade part. Room. But niggas was really playing that album because it was like a three-part, uh, yep. I admit it. It was I admit part one, I admit part two, and I admit part three. And niggas was like, this shit high key slide. And like, niggas was still fucking with the was, music of R. Kelly. That shit was crazy. I was, I was like, how are y'all okay with this? Like... <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, I got my two to three R. Kelly songs and I got trapped in the closet. Outside of that, I don't listen to the dude no more. Like, not when it comes to them love songs, them sex songs, because you don't know who he's talking about. And they've been saying mm-hmm. a lot of those songs could have been made off of young girls. So for people to sit and listen to the songs where he's literally saying, yeah, I did it. Yes, I did. Blah, blah, blah. And y'all sitting here saying, damn, this shit fire. Like, how was that fire? Like, that, it's just like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. That shit was nuts, though, just seeing that type of release from R. Kelly because it has to obviously be somebody else. But when did he record it is my question. Yeah. Because you're not recording it from prison, I wouldn't think. Nah, you're not recording it from prison. Nah, nah. Because, like, what type of prison are you in if you were re- being able to record music? So you had to record it before you went in. So it's like... Why are you even recording this type of music? Like, so you wanted this to come out eventually if you're making this type of music. Like, I'm just trying to get into the mind of this nigga. Like, what would make you think or what would make you make this type of music in the first place? You know what I'm saying? Maybe maybe it could have been a situation. He was just recording. He had probably no intention of dropping this shit. He was probably just venting and recording shit. But like his lawyer said, Somebody when he got arrested, we lost possession of the music and like all the files and shit. Somebody has it, but we can't really tell who has it based off of the fact that he lost it when he got arrested. So maybe mm-hmm. a situation where he was probably like, They listening to that shit. I ain't even mean for nobody to get that shit. I was just venting, I was just making that shit for myself. <laughs> like that's probably what he's thinking. <laughs> I mean, you should feel yourself. <laughs> you should not do that. You should not record anything like that. 
but <laughs> bro, R. Kelly was probably so sick. If he was still out, he probably would have played that while fucking a bitch or some shit. Like that's how probably. sick in the head he probably is. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So yeah, he's he's in the place where he needs to be in jail. Oh yeah, in for prison. sure. For sure. He's definitely in the place where he needs to be. Moving on to movie and show news, we got Rush Hour 4 in the making. Yeah, so Jackie Chan recently came out and said they are filming Rush Hour. They are either already filming or getting ready to start filming Rush Hour 4. It was a lot of mixed reviews on it, bro, because a lot of people were saying, we don't want it if y'all are going to make it a modern version of what Rush Hour would be. If we're not getting the same type of jokes and the same type of, like, you know, um, feeling we got with watching the first three, we don't want that shit. We don't want to watch a 2022 Rush Hour <laughs> movie because y'all yeah. are going to be way too socially conscious. Y'all probably not going to make the type of jokes y'all want to make. It's probably yeah. going to be corny as hell. Like, mm-hmm. if it's going to be like that, I don't want to see it, bro. And do we really need a fourth Rush Hour? I think they're fine with just leaving it at three. They're too old now anyway. Exactly. That's my question. But the thing is, they seen Bad Boys for Life they see how successful that buddy cop shit worked, and they're gonna steal that formula. But the th- I think Bad Boys and Bad Boys and Rush Hour had kind of had two different lanes though when it came to like wait, the wait. comedy and the jokes. Because they're gonna have another Bad Boys, I think. But they're gonna have I another Bad Boys. Martin Lawrence character is gonna be done, I believe, or he's not at least gonna be in the field and shit. Will Smith, yeah. I think him and his son. From Bad Boys for Life, I think they're gonna do some shit. So they're bringing I'm saying, in a young character and all that. I don't know what the fuck Rush Hour finna do. They just but I'm saying like Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan watched Bad Boys for Life and was like, we can do this shit. You know what I'm saying? Because we seen they looked older. There obviously was a difference there. I'm not saying that there's gonna be a Rush Hour five after this, but the Bad Boys for Life can be compared to the Rush Hour four for them. You know what I'm saying? Because Rush Hour yeah. three wasn't all that good anyway. But Rush Hour 4 can be their bad yeah, boys. Rush Hour 3? I Rush, Rush Hour 3 was cool, but it wasn't as good as the first two. It's definitely a huge... Oh, oh no, no, no. It, that that cool. shit was solid. The, the jokes, I think, were better than, like, the actual movie. I fought with the jokes oh. heavy in Rush Hour 3. That shit was funny. <laughs> what was the... Rush Hour 3 was when that bitch with her head, she had the, the shang list on her head? Yeah, she had the, um... Uh, damn, what was she called? What was her list called? Shanghai or some, some shit. Schindler's List. It was like Schindler's List on her head, basically. Damn, I forgot the name of the list, but yeah. They yeah, was in Paris. The list. Yeah, they was in Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I was cool. But Rush Hour 4, I think, could be okay. But it's not going to be the same type of jokes, like I said, because everybody's socially conscious. They are making those type of jokes before we were in this era. The thing about Bad Boys, it's like black on black. So you can make the black on black jokes, and that shit going to be fine. But making yeah. the black and Asian jokes, is that going to be okay now in 2022? Black on black was fine when Martin Lawrence and and uh Will Smith going at each other, but those Asian jokes niggas gonna be a little touchy now. Niggas gonna be sensitive. They can still do it, but niggas are gonna feel away about it because you know everybody gonna be fake mad of like I can't believe he said that in this movie. Oh my god, that was so socially insensitive. Like, you know they they ain't gonna be able to make gay jokes like how they probably used to do and whatnot. Like yeah. it, it's just it's certain. It's certain things that we loved about Rush Hour that we probably are not gonna get in this movie. We're probably sure. they're probably gonna give us this movie just for like a we just wanted to do this for the fans. Like I feel like that's how it's gonna be. I don't feel like they're get, really gonna put the effort in to like whatever the plot is. The fans weren't that. asking for this. You can't. We say weren't that even you asking for this. We like, weren't asking. We weren't asking for Rush Hour. <laughs> you can't say that you're doing movie, this for the fans, bro. The only old movie we were asking for was Friday, and that shit in the can at this point. That shit in the so, that shit is in the. Yeah, my man died. After my man died, it was it was a wrap. This yeah, shit is know, gonna hit. No, uh, Debo died, and oh, then also pop. my man, uh, John Wetzel. Yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah. damn, what the fuck was I was about to say, bro? This shit gonna hit like how ATL two. I don't know if they're still dropping that shit, but ATL two gonna be some garbage, and this shit gonna be some garbage too. I don't even want ATL two at this point. They were supposed <laughs> to drop. They were supposed to drop ATL two the next year after they announced that shit. It's been like three years since we saw that trailer of them walking up the road together. I was like, I don't want to see this shit now. Hey, the back hey bro, that wasn't even a trailer, my nigga. Them niggas just walked up and shit. I'm like, bro, what is this? Like, am we supposed to get more than this? No cascades Man. in the background. It's like, my nigga, where are we at? Because, like, I think with ATL 2, it wasn't going to hit 
if it if it does ever drop, it's not gonna hit because it's not, not gonna be yeah. Like yeah. first off, y'all are older. Second off, the movie has to be more realistic because everybody had a good future <laughs> when the movie ended. Like <laughs> like Teddy graduated. Somebody has to be bums in this year. Yeah, somebody has yeah, to Ted, yeah fell down. Teddy a hood dentist. Esquire done went the <laughs> goddamn Ivy League. Nunu in college. Mm. Rashad got a good nine to five working for the newspaper. Like everybody doing what the hell they supposed to do. Like Uncle George got a church lady. Like what hood shit are we gonna get with this movie for real? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what was my man doing? What was light skin? What was his brother doing? Oh, Brooklyn. Oh, he was oh, in no, school. No, you talking talk about uh um? Uh, I'm talking about Ti brother, the light skin. Twan. I think that was Twan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he, was he was freshman. in school. He was in school at the end of the movie, but it was like that nigga could easily go back to the streets. He he was like a sophomore, so it was like, yeah. okay, he's gonna he's a good student now, or whatever. And that nigga Brooklyn, he finally got promoted to manager at the pizza place. It's like everybody moving <laughs> up, everybody moving up in their own way. I it's guess too much good shit, too much but, good shit. But I I think that's why ATL hit so hard, bro, because like. I don't think they was trying to make no shit for everybody. They was just trying to make a raw ass hood movie on a big budget at that. Because we've seen people try to make hood movies and the shit be ass. But T.I., I don't know how T.I. got the budget to make that shit. But he you got really that need real... that high of a budget for ATL, bro. You didn't need that high of a budget. He got a higher that... budget than a lot of other motherfuckers that try to make hood movies. Because think about the setting, bro. We didn't have that much. We was just at niggas' houses the whole time. We yeah. wasn't really no one crazy. We was at we was, Cascades. We, we was, was at, at Cascades. House. We was, we in, was at um, damn Rashad House. We was in Buckhead, bro. We was all we over was there. We was in the we was in the parking lot. We nigga, we was at the tennis court. We bro, wasn't at we that was, many crazy ass places. We was bro. all over Atlanta. What are you talking about, bro? That wasn't no crazy shit. We, the red eye. We was on um. We was on like the northwest side of Atlanta at Cascade. We was on the opposite side at Buckhead. That take a day to shoot. We, we was downtown. Um. In Atlanta, when it went to the Waffle, not downtown, but it was in Mechanicsville, going to the Waffle House and going to school. But this is Ti, you know bro. This is Ti. So you know that nigga getting the hometown discount, my nigga. You know that nigga oh, yeah, ain't paying true. full that's price true. for this shit. I'm, 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 I'm talking about, about the, I'm talking about the production value of it. Even if he ain't oh, paid the budget, like the yeah, production yeah, yeah. value of it, that shit was through the roof. And how bro. many of these niggas were like really extras too? Like they not paying extra. Like this, that was probably just niggas at Cascades. Oh yeah, they was just dancing around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, y'all niggas ain't a part of this shit. Like everybody else, like Nunu and all them niggas was a part of it. These extras was extras. But yeah, that, that's a fire ass. I'm about to watch that shit probably tomorrow. Bro, ATL, one of the movies I could always watch, bro. I could facts, always watch facts, that shit. Facts, 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 bro. I could facts, always bro. watch it. All right, man. Moving on to Pastor Ox, bro. What you got for song of the week? Song of the week. I've been on Michael Jackson heavy. Mike um, Jack. Damn, I gotta go to that Thriller album, bro. Human Nature. Mm. That Thriller album, that's that's one of the best albums across all genres. That is probably the best album to ever be on planet Earth, bro. Damn, bro. I honestly got two of them this week, bro. I've been back in my Chief Keith bag. I ain't been in that bag since college, but uh, going back to his Thought Breaker tape from 2017, I got uh, Grab a Star by Chief Keith, and I got another one too, bro. Spend It by Coco Jones is crazy. I've been, bl- I've been blasting that song the whole week, so Spend It by Coco Jones. Give another one so we can put uh, two. Another one? What I've been on? What I've been on? Ooh, what I've been on, who I've been listening to. Damn, I need another one. You stopped listening to that Heroes and Villains? Nah, I just Oh, SZA just been. dropped this week, too. You you bought that SZA? That's what I'm saying. I ain't heard no SZA yet. That's crazy. I ain't heard no SZA I'm, I'm, I really haven't dived dove deep into the album. I've only been like five songs deep. Damn, who I'm going to get for my next song? Damn. Let me go ahead and get my shout out to Boston Richie. Uh, what song I want to get from Boston Richie? Uh, oh, that I want you, Boston Richie and Future. That shit slide, Boston Richie yeah. and Future. I want you. All right, and moving on to movie and show reviews. What we got coming up? Uh, Avatar. We got our Avatar review this weekend, y'all. So we're gonna go see Avatar two. Uh, hopefully tomorrow or Friday. We're going to try and see it before Saturday so we can actually record for the weekend for y'all. And we're going to give our 
um compare and contrast on Avatar that came out in 2009 and the new one. So you're going to get a reaction from both of those for us. Hey, uh, and before y'all go Guardian. watch that movie, please take a nap because that bitch is three oh, yeah. hours and ten. That for shit so, crazy. For so. Uh, Prey, Glass Onion, those are the other two big movies we got coming up. And after that, you know, that's that's the end of this year for the movies. Um, I think the 2023, the next big hype movie is what? Ant Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Woo! shout out to um, shout out to Scream. They got a Scream movie coming out in March. Scream Six. <laughs> that shit look good because for the first time in the entire franchise, it's in a totally different state in a totally different city. It's in New York, ah. and it look like it's multiple people who are killers. Like the shit look good. Mm. Shout shout out the screen for that. This shit look like it's going to be good. It come out March thirteenth. I think that was that was the date. I think. Damn. All right, I gotta check that out then. All right, and uh, also before we get out of here, definitely RP Twitch from Ellen, the DJ from her show. He passed away, yeah. ended up uh killing himself, unfortunately. But definitely prayers up to his family. Definitely wanted to give him a shout out, man. Before he uh. Before we ended up giving out the getting off this podcast, bro. Definitely rest in peace to him. Yeah, he, right, was, um, he was only 40 years old. That that's real sad, yeah. bro. Uh, to find it's out crazy. it was due to suicide. Like, make sure y'all check on y'all people's. Make sure y'all check on people you know you work with. You know, it, it doesn't take a lot to just be kind to somebody and just ask how somebody is doing, even if you don't fully care, care enough to where you make them feel like you care. You know, and mm. RIP to Paul Silas too, 79 years old. Ah. Uh, the NBA definitely lost somebody good with that one. So RIP to Twitch and RIP to Paul Silas. All right, man. We appreciate y'all for listening. And we out. Peace. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the QE podcast. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And feel free to listen to us anytime on all podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Submit all questions and inquiries to qnepodcast at gmail.com.